Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, my name is Aaron, a.k.a. Haroon Sellers. I say a.k.a. because literally my the name on my birth certificate, the name that my mother gave me is Aaron. And I became Muslim and I accepted Islam, converted to Islam, however you want to say that, in 1994. And it's just that every Muslim I've met since then, when they ask me what my name is, as soon as I say Aaron, they just automatically say, oh, Haroon. So they just automatically translate my name. And Hamdulads, it's a name, it's a name of a prophet. And uh, so I have no problem you call me Aaron or Haroon, no problem. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C. And from there moved to Maryland and then Virginia. And then from Virginia moved to the amazing California Bay Area, I think in the summer of 2000, uh, specifically to serve at what was then called Zaytuna Institute. And I literally just came to, initially to help Sheikh Hamza Yusuf to switch or make the transition from audio tapes, selling audio tapes to get into the digital age and get the material in the higher quality format of CD. And alhamdulillah, he said, why don't you just stay? And so I stayed, and I'm still here. And alhamdulillah, I'm very thankful to be the longest serving uh, person at what has now become Zaytuna College, alhamdulillah, at the top of a mountain in Berkeley, California. So it's really an honor and pleasure to be here in the Bay Area. Um, I'm happy also to be a father, happily married for over 20 years. I don't want to mess up the date. And I uh, hope my wife's not watching. <laughs> and um, I'm happily married, alhamdulillah, father of all girls. That's what I made dua for. I, I asked the law right after I got married. I said, oh, Allah, please give me all girls. And alhamdulillah, I have all girls. I'm the oldest of five. So I have three younger brothers and a sister. So I helped raise my brothers. And that experience, I think, is what led to me praying for all girls. <laughs> Um, so alhamdulillah, what I do at Zaytuna College is I'm an audio visual manager. I've been recording and preserving lectures and producing promotional videos, uh, and photography, which you can find on Zaytuna College YouTube channel, Facebook page, live stream page, and so forth. My motto is to capture and share light. Um, but as we'll get into, one of, the, the, one of my intentions in moving here as a family uh, was not just to serve, but to also be benefited. So not only to bring benefit, but to be benefited by what I saw was a, a, a growing community of knowledge. And so I really felt that um, not only could I bring a particular benefit to the community in terms of my audiovisual um, experience, but I really felt there was a dynamic, uh, growing, hungry community of knowledge and a particular way of uh, teaching that knowledge that was very attractive to me as a convert, uh, especially being that the founder himself, Sheikh Hamza, was a convert, and um, alhamdulillah. So that was really the impetus for us moving out here, uh, was to benefit myself and my family and try to bring a benefit. And it's really an honor to uh, be up here speaking with you in this capacity today. So, Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Azmat Zishan Mukhtar. I was born in Karachi, and uh, before the age of four, I came to the United States to New York. I lived in New York, uh, went to the public schools there, and then uh, around fifth grade came to the Bay Area. So, I was here in the Bay Area and uh, lived in different cities in the Bay Area. But then I moved to Saudi Arabia during my sophomore year in high school, lived there for a couple of years, and then moved to a Karachi, moved to Pakistan, lived with my grandparents away from my parents who were still in Saudi Arabia and uh, lived with my grandparents for a year and went to Karachi American School. So I was on three different continents for high school in three different years. So it was a pretty interesting uh, experience, some good, some bad, um, living in a Muslim country at that, at that time. Um, my parents prayed and taught me the religion, uh, but I kind of went out on my own so early that I feel like I grew up, once I came back to the United States, I came to UC Santa Cruz. It's pretty isolated, down south, the mountains and the beach, and I didn't have any Muslim sahaba. So 
I grew up and went to college uh, without family, without any support, on a continent all my own, uh, without any Muslim sahaba, and uh, you know, your environment affects you. So I grew up uh, long, for a long time I lived uh, pretty much my life without really much deen. So I can speak to, uh, the reason why I'm on the panel I believe is because I have that experience of, of sort of feeling uh, lost and trying to find myself and then going and transitioning into uh, deciding to marry a Muslim woman sitting right here on my left, and then uh, how are we going to approach um, you know, learning the deen and raising children. So I have three boys who uh, live in the Bay Area here. Uh, some of them are, are here, so maybe we're going to share some stuff that they're going to hear for the first time. And um, so I uh, wanted to be asked to be on the panel to try to understand uh, or help parents navigate what their children went to, because I, I feel with the, uh, the the stuff that I went through, I think I can understand. So hopefully, uh, this will be beneficial today. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. My name is Hina Khan Mukhtar, and I'm the wife of Zishan Mukhtar. Um, like he said, we have three sons. I used to be a high school and middle school English teacher, and I was also uh, very honored and blessed to be one of the founders of the homeschooling cooperative in Lafayette, California, known as Ilmtree which all three of our sons attended. Uh, we homeschooled them up cooperatively with other families up until eighth grade. And then they all did different things after eighth grade, which I guess we can go into later on about educational journeys for children if we get into that topic. Um, I, do, I write for Seeker's Guidance, and I've written a column uh, called, written for a column called Raising Our Ummah, which is for the Muslim Observer. They have different... Uh, columnists who write about different topics of parenting. They wanted a South Asian, an Arab, an African American, and a convert. And so I was the South Asian writer for that panel for a little over a year. So I have articles on parenting that are out there on the internet that people are welcome to read if they're interested. And I just wanted to add a little um, side story. So Brother Harun, it's interesting because in the late 90s, I purchased a video cassette called Pathways to Islam. <laughs> Pathways to Islam. And it was one of the first video cassettes we had. And in it, there were, were you, yeah, VHS. Were you guys in college then? Was it? Yeah. They were, it was like, yeah, so it was these three college students sitting at a, uh, at a table talking to an MSA about how they came to Islam. And I remember this one young man really standing out on the panel and talking about, he said, one day I look forward to having a Muslim wife and having Muslim children and lining them up behind me and leading them in prayer, mashallah. And, and who knew, mashallah. And then years later when I met him, I was like, oh my gosh, it's that celebrity <laughs> who I watched in the VHS. But mashallah, it's just, to me, that's just the proof of intentionality. And you never know when your du'as are going to be answered. And that was a wish he had, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than granted it, mashallah. Um, the, just to give you kind of a, an outline of how this is going to go. Uh, so as we mentioned, we, we gathered um, questions and survey responses online, which we will, uh, inshallah, address those at the second part of the panel. So it's, we're going to kind of split things in half and give you guys a little bit of a break to get a stretch and some water um, uh, in between. But this first half, what we're going to do is actually address some questions that the panelists have uh, or that we've received and that we're uh, we're gonna you know I'll, I'll go through each question and allow the panelists whoever feels they want to jump in and, and address that particular question um, uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there so again please send us your questions because the more the better we'll really have a really fruitful conversation um, uh, if we generate, uh, you know, if we get more questions from you. So, okay, so uh, inshallah, bismillah, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and read a question that we received. And again, I'm going to turn to the panelists and allow each of you to uh, just take it if you feel it's something that you want to speak about. Okay, bismillah. So the first question is, my parents expect me to get straight A's and to get into a top tier university. But then they expect me to do all of my prayers on time and also go to the mosque for Jamaah. How do I get them to realize that they, that they can't have it all? Something has to be given, given up. There's, there isn't time for everything right now in my life. So any of the panelists want to take this question? Yeah, OK. Bismillah. OK, so 
Mashallah, one of the things that is um, on a lot of parents' plates is to set their children up for success. And it's a big responsibility and it's a big weight and it's a big um, source of stress for many parents. And what, one of those responsibilities is helping their children be successful, not only in the dunya, but in the akhirah as well, inshallah. So parents who have been successful in teaching their children will teach their children the about time management skills and also about what is due to their Lord, right? That everything isn't just about succeeding in the dunya. So it can definitely feel like it's very, very overwhelming, but you can't have success in the dunya without actually turning to Allah and asking for his help. And that's something that parents realize and are trying to communicate with their kids. And sometimes maybe the communication skills can be lacking and it feels like there isn't empathy or there isn't sympathy and they're not getting what kind of pressure that children are under. And so it's going to be important to sit down with your parents and let them know that these are the things that are stressing me out. Um, help me figure out a way that I can manage my time so that I can be successful in the things that are important to both of us and inshallah pleasing our Lord and fulfilling his rights is also one of those things that are important. So one of the things that I saw um, work really well with a friend of mine is when her kids were in college and they were applying to universities, she made it really clear to her kids that they had six different areas of their life lives that they couldn't be neglecting and that all six areas needed to have something filling those, if you want to call them, time slots. So she, um, when, I, when she laid it out for me, I, I was a few years behind her, and when my kids came of age, I had the same discussion with them, and I have found it to be really, really helpful. So the six areas we talked about focusing on was that your body has a right over you, so physical health making sure that you're working out, you're getting exercise, you're getting sunshine, um, you know, you're going out and playing sports or having, having fresh air, right? And that you're not just in your room studying all the time. You're not just sitting at a computer the, the entire time. So physical, your body has rights over you. The second was that something education related. So regarding your education. So you have to be going for tutoring or you have to be taking your classes or going to um, college or whatever it is that's being fulfilled by taking, going to classes, taking care of your education. The third is career. So figuring out what you want to do um, and doing something in that direction, whether it's an internship or if you want to have pocket money, getting some kind of job, even if it's babysitting, something where you're doing something out there where it's not just your parents taking care of you 24-7, that you're out there also, you know, having some responsibility. So there is physical, there is educational, there is your career. The fourth was something for the community. So just making sure that you're out there, whether it's going to Jummah. For us, it was um, going to uh, Talif on Sundays. So just meeting with the community, making sure that you have some kind of bond with other Muslims. Some I know in her family, her son decided to tutor uh, students in underprivileged areas. So that was his way of giving back to the community. So that's, I've covered four now. So the fifth was um, religious. So making sure that you are praying or you're, you've got some orad, some kind of dhikr that you're doing. And the sixth was um, family time for the family. So even if it meant only having dinner once once a week, if that's all you could do is sit with your family and have dinner once a week or Sunday morning brunch, making sure that that was fulfilled. So they laid it out as a chart and then their kids had to figure out how they were going to fill every single one of those slots. And we did that in our family as well because there was a time where I noticed like with one of my sons, all those slots were being filled but exercise was being neglected. And so it was like, no, no, we got to figure this out. Like, how are you going to be going out and making sure that you're taking care of your health as well? Or with one of the other kids, everything was being fulfilled, but family time was being neglected. We never saw him at the dinner table because he was always running in different directions. And sometimes one thing could take care of two of those things. So like one of my sons teaches Quran in the community. So for him, 
that was his religious thing because it gave him a chance to review his Quran, but it was also his giving back to the community. But making sure every one of those slots is filled, otherwise you're going to have an imbalanced life. And then inshallah, tawfiq comes, right, with praying to Allah for that, for success. So inshallah, may Allah make it easy. Thank you so much, mashallah, for that comprehensive uh, response. Sure, of course. Let me pass this down. That was a great list. I took time to, like I said, this is a, um, this is not a top-down uh, type of form. That's not the intention. Um, just like I said, in terms of my reasons for even coming to the community, it is to my my goal here is to bring benefit, but also to be benefited uh, by the things I hear. So thank you very much for that, uh, Sister Hannah, for that list because I'm the total opposite. I'm like the head in the clouds, artsy kind of father, kind of person. And that trickles over into how I parent. But one of the things I, I try to consistently uh, do or an essential ingredient in my parenting style is to always really try to be aware of what's the bottom line and everything. Because honestly, just hearing the list when I heard that question, I was like, you know, if you think about it, like even as parents, we're still struggling with that same, okay, how do we work full time and be a full time father, full time husband, you know, and also get all my prayers in on time, also participate in community events. I mean, like this one, even being here today, like I'm so thankful for all of you for taking time out of your Saturday uh, to be here. I'm not worried about the numbers of people here, but just you know, the people who did show up, I really appreciate it. And also for the panelists, you know, for to take time out of your schedules to be here and participate in something community. I myself tend to be a, a caveman. You know, when I'm off work, I just want to be in the house all day, all night. And um, so I really appreciate that uh, Sister Hosai brought me out, forced me out of the cave uh, today. <laughs> um, because alhamdulillah, I do work. I'm surrounded by my, you know, by Muslims, just by the nature of working at Zaytuna College. We also have a lot of events. So I tend to, in my off days, just want to be by myself or, again, just locked into the cave. Um, but it's important. So I just wanted to acknowledge that modern life in and of itself is very challenging, especially, as, you know, saying this as a convert, you know, coming from a lifestyle. Well, yes, I was Christian before this, and we had our beliefs and our do's and don'ts. But we didn't have a structure such as the five daily prayers. I mean, that changed everything for me. Trying to, like, literally, like, on Monday I wasn't Muslim. Tuesday I was. So I come to work Tuesday as a Muslim and have to tell my manager, hey, I'm going to have to step out back in the storage room or in the hallway back, back here to do these prayers. It's going to take maybe a couple minutes. And how do I explain now? I was like, well... So-and-so, he always takes a smoke break, like to smoke a cigarette, and that takes a couple minutes. Well, I'm just going to pray. You know, so, so he got it right away. Like, oh, okay, yeah, go do your thing. So it's challenging. That was very challenging to figure out how to do this five times a day within its time. So I just wanted to acknowledge that it's not just um, our, our kids who have this struggle. We should acknowledge that we also have a struggle with this. And one of my parenting principles is to make religion a group effort. Make the practice of the religion a group effort. Yes, you know, I appreciate that, that God has given us a sense of order and a kind of a chain of command in terms of who's the leader of the house and who's the minister of the interior <laughs> and so forth. And I appreciate that. And my family is aware of that. And we respect that. But in terms of our practice of the faith, I said, this has to be a group effort. I don't want your Islam to just be dependent on what you see myself and your mother do. I felt that would be a tragedy. <laughs> you know, and again, um, one of my purposes was moving was to also expose my, my, young, my young daughters um, to other women and also other men who practice Islam, and they also bring their different unique flavors. But we're kind of all in this together because I felt that there's too much weight to just put all the Islam just on my shoulder and just what dad thinks and just what mom thinks and she has her baggage and background and, 
in particulars, and so do I. But when you come in community, and you especially have a community that, that's around not just one teacher, but several, you know, and not just male teachers, female teachers of knowledge, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous gift to be able to benefit from these different perspectives and from these different flavors, but all of it's still rooted in loving Allah, trying to love Allah and grow that love, and trying to fall in love with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I try to, to, to keep things really grounded and, and also be very open with my children um, about my spiritual struggles, because sometimes I think that's what creates part of the distance, is when they feel like, all oh, dad and mom is just trying to ask us to do all this and that, and it's like, well, what about dad and mom? Do they have struggles? Are they going through anything? And that's something we try to be really open with, you know, in, in, my, in my family. And my daughter, Miriam, is here, and I'm glad, you know, she chose to be here today. And um, so she's what I call the fact checker in the audience, <laughs> you know, for anything I say that's not truly representative of the realities on the ground, she can call me out on that, but also that, you know, she can participate as well as each of you. But I just wanted to, to, to bring that out that it's, you know, I try to make it a group effort and that it's challenging for parents and kids. And that's one of the reasons that we're all here. Alhamdulillah, thank you. All right, so we'll go on to the next question. Mashallah, there's quite a few. And again, please, I'm gonna keep reminding you so you don't forget to turn in any additional questions you have. So another question that, we ha that we've that we received, and again, I'll leave it up to the panelists who want to address it to answer. Um, this one is a hot one that I've heard quite a lot as well, and it's regarding uh, smartphones and social media. I'm sure a lot of the teens and the parents here, here or watching will agree that this is probably a big topic of debate and contention in the household. So the question is, um, how have you or how do you and your children navigate? How can we navigate the slippery slopes of uh, smartphones, devices, and just social media in general? Um, so I do have some comments, but I'm going to allow the, the panelists to speak on this first. So anybody want to jump on this? Okay. Well, smartphones and social media. This is a big one. So I'm sure everybody in this room has a smartphone. And how many people in some platform or another are engaged in social media? Anybody besides myself? most of the folks here. So what's the dominant app or platform that you're on? Facebook? Instagram, WhatsApp? Anybody else? What about the gentleman here? What's kind of the dominant? LinkedIn? YouTube? Okay. Facebook? Instagram? WhatsApp? So WhatsApp, I think, is a big one. I'm actually new to that. I was really trying to be the last holdout on planet Earth who was not on WhatsApp, but uh, 2019 was the year that I gave in. <laughs> and uh, I can't even remember. It was for some type of assignment, as they always start. It's so for a project. And now um, I have WhatsApp. But for myself, it's mostly Instagram, Facebook, and especially for Zaytuna College, um, I'm on all of those platforms as well. Now, one thing I'll say up front, and this even has to do with, is related to a, one of my book recommendations, which is uh, The Disappearance of Childhood by Neil Postman. I highly encourage uh, every family to have that book and to read it as a family, or at least one person in the family read it and share what they've learned from it. The Disappearance of Childhood by Neil Postman. It's, it's kind of a difficult read. It's a very thin book. But uh, the language is very dense, and the concepts are very dense. So it's not an easy read, but it's one read that really was influential on me as a human being, and especially as a parent, um, just by the title, The Disappearance of Childhood. And it's like, what do you mean by, we still have children in the world, right? So what does he mean by the disappearance of childhood? And technology has to do a lot with that disappearance. And one of the things that he articulates in that book is the, he gives the analogy 
of the parents' door, the door to the parents' room. And what that represented, you know, for him, you know, growing up as a child in the period of time that he grew up, and it made me think of what that represented for me. The, the door to the parents' room represented privacy, right? If the door to your parents' room is open, you kind of know you, as a kid, you kind of maybe have a general permission to kind of wander in or peek in or something. But if the door to your parents' home is closed, do you feel like you can just barge in yourself? If your parents' door is like closed, do you feel like you can just barge in anytime? Yes or no? Honestly. Kind of yeah? What about you? No? Are you sure? Because he said it quick. He was like, no. <laughs> like something bad will happen <laughs> if I do that. What about you growing up? The parents' door. Did it kind of represent privacy or it was like a swinging door. You can just walk in and out. Privacy? What about you in the green sh Levi shirt? This brother right here? Yes. Growing up, did your parents' door, did that represent privacy or all access? Privacy, okay. Sister side? Privacy or all access? Any door closed? Okay, good point. Any door closed is privacy. So same here. That, as a kid growing up, if the door was closed, like you definitely had to knock. And even coming up to knock, I had to, I felt like a sense of like, as I got closer, it was like, <laughs> like my heart, you know, w would beat. But he mentions the analogy of the door in the, in, the, in, the, in the book that he said what the parent's door represented in terms of that barrier between the life of the, the, the child and the, that stage of development as a child. And where you are as a parent, that door, because of all access technology, has been removed. So now, even though your parent's door could be closed, because of the nature, especially of a technology such as the internet, and then especially since the internet, that you can have a pocket-sized device that can give you access to that portal, now the door, the parent's door, doesn't mean anything in terms of what that would prevent in terms of there's intimacy that takes place privately. Now you can see anything, all forms of human interaction on something that's in your pocket. So he said the door to the parent's room has been removed even if it's closed. Number two, one of the challenges that we have is the new technologies are happening at a rate faster than which we have the capacity to analyze its effects for good or for bad. So we're just, technology is happening to us at a rate faster than which we have the capacity to analyze its effects. And that's why you're always hearing about things that are coming out, oh, later you found, oh, now this is causing cancer. Oh, now this is causing this. And now this is causing this. And that's what we're dealing with here. So my bottom line, I'm sorry to, sorry to be long, but it's, it's a big, big issue. And really part of my answer is the jury is still out on this thing. We can talk about some of the effects and challenges that we have, but it's still affecting us in ways we don't even realize. And so one of the ways that we've chose to navigate is, is we didn't start our kids out on smart phones, if you will, because we wanted them to be smart first before we just dumped smartphones. So we had just normal dial flip phones. You know, they didn't have to have the latest and greatest. So we started them out on that, and you shouldn't feel pressured. That, okay, we have to start my kids out on the latest iPhone or the latest technology just because that's what you're using as a parent or as you exist. Also, in terms of apps and things like that, you have to navigate that with them. Whatever they're signed up in, ask them about it. If they're asking to sign up, find out what this app is about. What does it do? And why do you want to join Instagram? Why do you want to join Facebook? Why do you want to join WhatsApp? Instead of everything, it's just you just assume it's fine and innocent, and then you can end up with a disaster, literally a disaster. So at least if nothing else, I just want to encourage parents and children to like take a, a, an inquisitive role with this. And just because your parents are asking you why doesn't mean they just want to invade your privacy, but you should be yourself have good reasons why I'm trying to get into such and such. And we'll explore a little bit deeper 
what I would call like the big picture things that should influence questions we should ask ourselves before engaging. Um, I think social media is really something that we can't escape and it's pretty much all around us and kids are engaging with it to a certain extent. So it's good really to be prepared and to help guide our kids through it. So like um, Sidi Harun said, we also in our family um, did not, our, our sons did not have smartphones in high school, which, you know, they... It, it was an agreement, an understanding that we had, and uh, one of my sons said that in high school, people used to be amazed by his flip phone because they didn't even know those existed anymore. They would take pictures of his flip phone. But when they graduated from high school, they got an iPhone. That was like our graduation gift to them. So it wasn't something forever. They knew that eventually it was coming. But through the high school years, they didn't have a smartphone. My youngest is in, in high school now, and he still doesn't have a smartphone. He has an old smartphone that, that is at home you know, on which he can WhatsApp with relatives, with the cousins, but it doesn't have Wi-Fi access when he leaves the home. Um, once my, our sons did get smartphones and they were on social media, we had a discussion about it. And one of the understandings we had in the beginning, and this is not the case anymore, my older two are in college, they're independent, I, we, we trust them to know the difference between right and wrong, inshallah. But in the beginning, when they first started out on social media, the understanding was that because we were paying for their phones, and it was because we were paying for it that they had access to this technology, that they had to um, agree to friend their mother on social media, and um, also uh, to, to respect, my husband isn't that much on social media. I was on it more, but the understanding I had with my sons, and they agreed to it before they decided they were going to take on social media. I, I, we told them you can choose one at the time, and they both decided to go for Instagram over Facebook. And... Um, they agreed that if there was something that I didn't approve of, of what they were posting or what they were clicking like on, that they would respect uh, their, their mother's opinion on that topic. So, and then helping them figure it out because like when you're first getting on social media, especially with young men, um, you know, clicking like on a girl's selfie, they may think they're just being nice, that okay, somebody posted a selfie, so I'm just gonna click like. But then we would talk about the, deeper layered discussion behind that, that, well, what does it mean to click like on a girl's self-portrait, right? Like, would you be staring at a girl's face in real life and going, you know, I like the way you look, or would you look away and have modesty? And is it appropriate? And also, if any of their friends were posting about haram things, like friends from high school, if they're posting about getting drunk, or if people are posting pictures of themselves dressed really inappropriately. Is that something you want to be taking in on a daily basis? That becomes your suhba, that becomes your companionship. So having discussions about it at a spiritual level and getting them to think about how these things affect them. But like I said, um, my youngest is not on social media. My older two do have Instagram and Snapchat. Um, and we are not now monitoring how they use it. It's, they're, they're independent. But in the beginning, when they first started, like right after they graduated from high school, yeah, there was oversight on our part. So we, um, you know, this, we're taking long on this topic because I think it's a very charged topic. Uh, we had specific rules that uh, my wife and I promised to monitor. One is that we don't use the computer or the internet related devices in our own rooms with the door closed. So I, sit in the lounge, we have a lounge, we have a family room, public spaces. Our younger son always does homework and his um, one does homework in the lounge, one does work in the dining room. So we're always in, in, in open spaces and we model that behavior. Um, the other thing is um, we see that, you know, there's middle school kids want to aspire to high school kids. High school kids want to aspire to college kids. And this is the, this is where kids can get into trouble. Our, our job as parents is to understand where they're at and what they can navigate successfully. 
So we've talked to our children and decided, you know, uh, no, we know them very well. They know themselves. Hopefully we're getting them to know themselves. Is to understand what they can navigate successfully and where their yeses and nos are. And then working with them to build, for them to build trust with us and for us to trust them. And then there's consequences if that trust is broken. So, you know, it's, it's working together with the children. I believe for us, it was 16 was the age for Sean. Now I think social pressures, it's like I've heard of nine-year-olds at work who's, who, who give their children smartphones. That's, that's so young um, to be on social media. And they're building social media platforms to addict smaller children. They have Facebook for kids and Nickelodeon for kids. I don't know what's going on, but this is just going to take them away from what they need to do to be successful and be addicted. So uh, it is an unpopular thing that parents have to do, but we do have to do it, but you have to work with your children and model good behavior. I agree with everything that's been said, and I just wanted to add a few more tidbits and then we'll move on from this topic. As far as um, from the children's perspective, I think one of the things that we as uh, parents have to understand is just saying no without really explaining what your you know restrictions isn't going to be effective. Children, we sometimes underestimate them and their under, their ability to comprehend. And obviously, you have to speak at their level. So young children, you know, you don't need to sit there and tell them about all the dangers necessarily of technology, but rather you know make it clear to them that these devices will actually hurt them in terms of their uh, you know cognition, in terms of their eyes, in terms of their brain function. Children can understand that the same way candy, for example, can hurt their teeth. Right when we tell them don't eat too many sugary things, you'll get cavities. Being on devices, whether it's social media or television, screens in general, literally hurt them. And you can even see it from them. I mean, give your child you know, an opportunity to watch a young child, a toddler, anything for more than 20, 30 minutes. They themselves kind of come out a little, you know, they're affected by it. But point that out to them so that they can themselves see you're not uh, just being restrictive, you know, for no reason. You're actually doing your job as a parent to protect them from things that they don't understand. And as they get older at different phases, and this is why it's so important to understand uh, child development and how children communicate differently at different stages. Be before the age of seven, they're in a, a, a land of total, you know, just fantasy and, 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 and creativity and imagination, and they don't really understand, you know, abstract thoughts. So speaking to them uh, gently and being, you know, firm, I mean, like, uh, you know, Zishan said, there are parents who capitulate to the whining of a toddler and go, okay, fine, you can have it for two, three hours, you know, b go watch your videos because they think think the, the child is so sad and I need to, you know, make them happy. When in fact, I mean, this is, you know, yes, you might be emotionally giving them something that they want, but you're not um, making, you're, it's not a good thing to do that. And you as a parent should feel confident that when you say no, you're not harming the child, you're not scarring the child, the relationship between you and the child is not going to be fractured permanently. Yes, they might throw a tantrum. Yes, they might be upset, but that's okay because they don't understand at that age that when you put those restrictions out there, it's for their benefit. They just, like anything, with anything that you take away from a child, it's nuffs, right? It's a natural respond, response uh, for a child to whine for it. But just, you know, we wouldn't allow them to do for example, to, to, to operate a, a vehicle when they're young because we know how harmful that is and we would never be like, okay, sure, go take the car for a spin because you're whining for it. We have the presence of mind to know how dangerous that is. In my opinion, and I say this without any uh, you know, hesitation, social media is far more dangerous and these devices than a vehicle, than, an operate, than, a, than a motor vehicle in terms of our children's safety. I really, truly believe that. Uh, it is a very, very dangerous. So you have to just kind of know at different stages how to talk to your children and how to appropriately explain to them your reasonings. As they get older, have them watch certain things so that they understand. For example, with my children, I very early on explained to them the word addiction. Like, what does the word addiction mean? And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us weak, and that if we don't learn how to self-regulate, like stop ourselves, then we can fall into behavior that we can't control. And that can come in different forms, and you can explain. And then letting them know that this is one way that these devices, that they're made to literally addict us. So that once they understand the concept of addiction, and then you put some boundaries around certain things, they'll understand. This is just generally 
good advice. It's not specific to me and this thing, but it's actually, you know, just, again, makes sense. I don't want to harm myself, first of all. I don't want to be addicted to anything. And then as they get older and it's age appropriate again, now you can start having really serious conversations and let them know that, listen, your brain, for example, the adolescent teen years, it's really important for, children, for parents to know this, which is why I applaud the panelists for knowing this, that before a certain age, you know, there's three stages of adolescence. Before the late adolescent stage, Children's prefrontal cortex is not fully developed. This is what controls their impulse, it gives them impulse control. So when you give a child something that they themselves don't have the mechanism to self-regulate with, you are putting them in a position to self-harm. And that's what we do when we don't realize that, you know, these giving access to these things to children before they're ready, they are going to be affected by that negatively. So just to, you know, kind of end this, um, I did a presentation yesterday on, you know, coming of age and just the different stages, stages of adolescence. The late adolescence phase is between 18 to 21. So this is for, for teens, this is when really they fully, fully develop and become, you know, adults in every sense of that word. But what are the benefits or what, what happens? What are the milestones of this stage? Firmer identity, ability to delay gratification, ability to think ideas through, Ability to express feelings in words, more developed sense of humor, stable interests, greater emotional stability, ability to make independent decisions, ability to compromise, okay, self-reliance, greater concern for others. So again, you're, when you uh, finally make that decision, and as Hina said, I agree 100%, we cannot escape these things. Let's be real, be practical. This is the world that our kids are inheriting. They need to be able to be a part of this world. But we, as their parents, have the responsibility, and it's it, we will be asked about this, to make sure we don't put them in a position where they're going to harm themselves. So delay these as much as possible. And I'm, I'm going to, my children are 10 and 7 years old. I haven't yet, and that's why, mashallah, I'm so grateful for the panelists because they've actually lived this. I am speaking as someone who talks to teens, who talks to parents. And in my own way, yes, with my kids because of their age, I have already implemented everything I'm saying in terms of having those open conversations and making sure that they understand why the restrictions are there. But I very much plan to delay any type of social media and internet connection as long as possible. And uh, alhamdulillah, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I'm with my children and that I educate my children at home. I know for a lot of parents it's not necessarily uh, easy because schools now require so much interaction online. But we still have the choice as parents to make sure that we don't give them uh, access to things, like I said, before their brains can do exactly what we want them to do, which is to self-regulate, right? When their brains have developed those skills, as mashallah, um, the examples that were shared, they themselves have, an, inshallah, the internal mechanism to realize, you know what, I don't need to be on this for 45 minutes straight. I can put it away. Or, you know what, my prayers are coming in. I better, you know, stop because before I really get distracted by this. That all of that comes with age and with, you know, the again, this this uh, it's it's a spiritual process, but it's also very much physical physical development. So let's be smart as parents and know these things about our children before we say. It's okay, they're whining for it, all the other kids are doing it. That's the kind of rhetoric that gets us sold onto being, to, to, to giving them things and capitulating to their whininess, not realizing we're actually causing a lot more problems for them. Because God forbid, God forbid, wallahi, and I've heard horror stories, I know my fellow panelists have well, horror stories of parents freaking out about things that their kids, young kids have been exposed to. Uh, on one of my iPads, for example, I have, I've removed the, uh, the browser completely. No browser, no YouTube. If they want to watch anything, it comes through the only, you know, the, the apps that I know that are safe. We have to be able to, to think like this, think outside the box, remove certain things. Why do they need an internet browser when they're four or five years old? Because it just takes one accidental hit on that, one accidental letter. Sometimes you don't even need to write a whole word. Sometimes it's just a couple of letters. And I'll tell you one, subhanAllah, and this is just my own personal uh, experience, and when I really got um, hit with, with the fear of God, this is the, the, it's just such a uh, scary time that we're living in. I was doing uh, a search for an ayah, the ayah of, in the Quran, I can't remember the reference now, but you know, to hold on to the rope of Allah. I did a search for this, and I was trying to look for an image that would go with this ayah. By doing a search for an ayah of the Qur'an, the rope of Allah, 
and I don't recommend anybody to do this, but I actually did this, and I did an image search, and as I was searching, Audhu Billah, there was a pornographic image in the search results of an ayah of the Qur'an. Do you see? Because the, the people behind these systems and the way that the algorithms work, they're made, they're, it's intentional. They want you, they want our children to get something where it's like, you know, they just click on it, and next thing you know, Pandora's box, and it's over. They want that. So they're going to find ways to make sure that words that you type in connect to things that have nothing to do with anything that you're looking for. Because that's that's their intention. The more addicts they have, the more pockets their pockets are filled. Be smart and know that, that these are the dangers and what we're up against. Yes, please. Just a couple of quick short comments, inshallah. Um, so one of my sons uh, was here actually at MCC, and uh, one of the uncles in the community approached him, and he said, I just recently became a parent, and I tell me something that your parents did with you guys that you think was really, really beneficial. And my son was like, I don't know. I'm just a kid. Go ask my parents. They're the ones who And he was like, no, no, no. I want to hear from the kid's perspective, honestly. Just tell me the truth. What do you think? was one of the most beneficial things that your parents did for you while you were growing up. And this uncle told me, the, the young dad told me, that my son um, told him that, honestly, it was not allowing us to have internet-enabled devices in the privacy of our bedrooms. So that was probably the most beneficial thing that they did because I've actually personally witnessed what's going on with some of the people in my generation addictions and the problems that they're suffering that their parents don't even know about. So I thought, you know, it's interesting because at the time it might be painful and it might it's not fun and you might be the bad guy, but inshallah, inshallah, uh, one day your kids will thank you and hopefully, you know, they're going to have all other issues they're going to be dealing with with their own children, but they're going to see that you sometimes have to go against the grain of what everybody else is doing. The other quick comment I, comment I wanted to make was I wrote an article called How to Protect Your Children from the P-Word. I think, I think that was the name of the article. The editors chose the title, so I sometimes have a hard time remembering titles of my own articles. But um, How to Protect Your Children from the P-Word. And it's about pornography addiction. And at the time when I wrote it, I wrote it when my kids were still pretty little. So a lot of the focus of the article was about prevention. It was a lot of about, you guys need to be aware about what's out there. You guys need to be worried. You need to protect your kids. And the analogy I used in the article is that you have to treat the internet like a loaded weapon. That the way you would treat a loaded weapon in your home is the way you treat the internet. And you keep it under lock and key. You don't leave kids alone with it. You know where it is at all times. Anyway, it made it onto a Reddit uh, thread. And I, once, I was looking through the comments that people were leaving about the article, and somebody left a comment saying, this lady who wrote this article sounds like she's the worst parent in the world. And what is she planning to do? Follow her kids to college? And that kind of like took me aback. And I, you know, there's a lot that we can learn even from our critics. And I thought about why was that the reaction that this person had to the article? And then there was a whole debate between the commenters under, uh, based on that person's criticism. And what I realized was that that article, so much of the focus was about prevention that it didn't, at that time, the focus, because my kids weren't older, wasn't really about how to navigate it once you are around it. So those of you parents who are here whose kids are teens, it's, I think the time of like making sure they're not using uh, the internet or don't have privacy with it is pretty much over. It's really until age maybe 14 that you can, you can even do that. Uh, the hadith of uh, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu is just perfect where he said, Te uh, play with your children for the first seven years, teach your children for the second seven years, seven to 14, right? And then be their friend for the third seven years, so 14 to 21. And it, it's very true. Whatever you want to teach them, you really have until age 14. After 14, it's pretty much maintenance. You're just maintaining whatever you've taught them. So what I was explaining about our kids when we gave them the smartphones when they graduated from high school, at that point then it was just 
maintaining the adab of how to interact with one another on social media, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, what's not good for your heart to look at, to be reflecting about what is it that my eyes are taking in and how is this affecting me. And the last thing is I personally will admit that I have a social media addiction problem. So I can lecture my kids all I want, but I'm on my phone a lot, looking at WhatsApp, looking at Facebook, looking at Instagram. Um, so I personally recently made the decision to cut myself off from Facebook and Instagram for 40 days because I was told by a sheikh that anytime you want to make something part of your nature, you do it for 40 days. And if you can do it for 40 days, it becomes part of your nature, inshallah. And uh, I've been going through ups and downs. I won't lie. It, it's, I, I'm an addict. I'm an addict, and I, I have to admit that. And my kids are seeing me go through that process. My, my son was looking at his Instagram yesterday, and I was like, oh, let me look over his shoulder. And he's like, no, 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 you, you cannot be anywhere near this. You're trying to quit this cold turkey. You should not even be glancing at what I'm looking at. But anyway, um, you know, our kids can also learn from our struggles, too. We're, we sometimes focus so much on teaching them and lecturing to them about how they should be, but we also have to look at ourselves, too. Like, what are we looking at all the time? How are we keeping ourselves busy? You know the amazing thing about the human brain and eyes is that you can't unsee and you can't unremember what you saw. So my first look at pornography was by mistake. You know, I actually walked into, we, we did an exam, kids were on break, they went and got a VCR, a bunch of stack of videos when I was in college, just, just entered college, and I walked into their room and I turned, walked in and I turned to the right and I saw the image on the television. I didn't know what I was going to see, and I'd never seen it before, but I remember that image right now. To this day, if I close my eyes right now, I can remember that image. I know exactly what was going on, the scenario, the place, what was happening. That first image was 40 years ago. Okay, it was oh, 25 years ago, making myself older, sorry. I should be subtracting. Um, anyway, the problem is, you know, we, we're not like a computer. We can't go and delete our, our hard drive. And the worst part about it is that when you're in solitude, when your eyes are closed, when you're trying to think about your Lord, and when you're trying to pray, that's when it gets you. It's not sitting here right now, you know, that I would have that image pop into my brain. And alhamdulillah, one of the things I realized is some of those kids that were my friends, once they got a taste of it, man, they would make a straw as long as, the, as long as a mile wide to get more. And for me, I looked at it, and alhamdulillah, I, I, I swear, I make dua, I, I do shukr to Allah that this day that I, my initial reaction was disgust. Because had it not been, you don't know. You're just rolling the dice. You don't know if you're going to get a one or a six. And a six means you're in, man. You cannot get out of that. You're going to fight with that for the whole life. I, I, I was disgusted by it, and I still remember it. Right? Alhamdulillah, whenever I came across it, I didn't need it. I didn't have to affect it. But those kids that, I, that went into it, I, didn't, I couldn't be friends with them anymore because they were on a track where they wanted something different. And let's be real. Boys want, boys on the internet, it's, it's visual and it's porn. Girls, what they want is validation. Friends. You want to be with 17 friends. Oh, does she like me? Does she think I'm her friend? Does she like my picture? How do I look? Do I get validation? So the addiction is very different for girls and boys. So we have two different things that we need to watch. So I wanted to show this perspective and my perspective. You know, we, what do we do when we're not looking at it? We check sports stores. Gore's not that harmful. But the porn is really diff very dangerous for boys. And the social interaction is very dangerous for girls. So uh, I just wanted to share my story since we're getting personal here. Uh, I thought that would, that would benefit this topic. Sorry, but this, this is a huge, this is probably one of the most pressing issues that we're up against in terms of technology and smartphones and how do we deal with it. And, and that's why I'm glad that we're still talking about it because I think there's a lot of silent suffering going on, and there's a lot of silent sinning going on. And uh, one of the biggest things that we're dealing with is dealing with 
is we're dealing with the big nuffs. And that's what we're up against. We're up against our own nuffs. And when you have a kid, now you have all these other nuffs that you have to deal with. And that's hard. You know, and I just wanted to mention there is a documentary called Social Animals um, on Netflix. It doesn't have any nudity or anything, thank God. But that's a good where you have a series of teens talking about how they use social media. And just like the brother said, and, it's, it's, and the sister said, actually, it, it's an addiction. And how that addiction has played out in some of their lives for good and how it's played out, you know, for some of them in the negative. Sometimes it's helpful to look at things that can help you analyze your own uh, situation. But I just wanted to highlight that what we're up against ultimately is a big Nuffs. And everything that we're doing uh, as a family is what are we saying? We're Muslims. So, what does that mean that we're Muslim? Okay, that means there's supposed to be a set of principles that we are aspiring to live our lives by. Okay? It's different if we don't have Islam. Okay, so everything that we're going to talk about in this panel, at the end of the day, it has to be rooted in divine principles, guidance that we're referring back to, or else it's easier for the kids to be like, okay, that's just mom, that's just dad. No, it should be, it's Allah. It's the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's this righteous person. We have to, as parents ourselves, be dipping into that guidance, or else, like they say, you can't give what you don't have. And they're always just going to be pointing at you and blaming you as parents, if you're not bringing it back to a, a higher non-human source, you know, for inspiration and guidance. Jazakallah khair. That's an excellent question. And I think, mashallah, uh, Hina shared her own example. And I'll, if, she, if she wants to speak more on that. But I think just taking from what she said as a general rule of not having double standards. You know, having one standard for yourself and then having a different standard for your children is going to solicit that response, right? But if you implement a, a culture in your family where we all follow the same rules, because as Sidi Harun said, this is all about all of us are on the same boat. Parent and child, we are all servants of God. We're all created with the same, uh, you know, reason. We ha we're accountable to him. And he's the one that we have to, you know, be mindful of. It's not about, so, I, you know, I, I've written about this um, uh, before on just, you know, different posts that I've put up. But we as parents have to kind of remove our, ourselves from the equation sometimes for our children. I feel like we get in the way because we become the ultimate authority of everything. And, we, and that's called, you know, authoritarian parenting. And it's not, I'm not a fan of it at all because I think it causes these very negative exchanges and dynamics where trust is broken and the relationship just becomes a tit-for-tat situation. Whereas when you actually have, um, you know, the correct Islamic model of parenting, it's authoritar authoritative where you are, you are in a position of control and leadership, but you also recognize that you are, like them, the same. We're just at different phases, right? And so have the same standards, have the same rules for yourself. And that way your daughter can't make it about you, but it's rather, listen, just like I don't trust myself because, you know, Allah, you know, this, there's actually du'as about this, you know, it's like protect me from my own self, you know, because we have weakness. We're all made weak. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always to protect us from our own lower selves and from shaitan and waswasa. And so have that type of, you know, dialogue in front of your children so that they understand this isn't, I'm this, you know, uh, I'm, I'm impervious to these things and you're weak. When you ex explain it that way, you're going to get, you know, that rebuttal. But if it's like, listen, we're all weak. This is a really dangerous thing. These are the rules of the house. Everybody has to follow it. End of topic, right? Sure. Okay, sure. There's a, there's a question online about struggling with hijab, but the second part of the question is that... Um, Along with phones, they're used everywhere, and the teacher automatically assumes that you have a phone. So, for example, when you're uh, in a group, in order to communicate at home, in order to uh, communicate with your coworkers and with your students, you need a phone. How do you tell the teacher my whole and my whole group that I don't have a phone, and it's very embarrassing, and I need it, and that people assume that I need it? So this is the second portion of this question. We'll address the other one, but uh, maybe we want to just touch on that now. I'm sorry, there's something that the sister said I think is really important, which is your 
the, the potentiality of your child when you're restricting them from something saying, why don't you trust me, right? That, you have to remember that's, that question goes both ways. You could also ask that same question, why don't you trust me? You know, why, why don't our children trust us? Because generally speaking, trust is something that's built over time. Okay, so that's what I mean about, again, going back to a big thing in my family is making it a group effort. You know, I've, because I made a, a deal with my wife that we did not want to religiously traumatize our children. Because I had seen a lot of that, you know, as a, as a young convert working with a lot of Muslim youth. I know you all have experienced it, uh, maybe even in your own lives and in the lives of others, religious trauma that happened in the home. You know, we're talking about external forces, but there's also internal forces that are traumatizing religiously that are happening right in our own home. So trust is something that's built. It's built over time. And so, again, don't be afraid to counter some of their questions with the exact same question. And to, to even if that trust is not there, then you can use that as a mom to say, you know what, maybe we're not very trusting of each other, and we, let's work on that. And it takes doing activities with each other, going out and experiencing mutual, mutual things together, finding out what other types of things your son or daughter are interested in, and participating in those things, being there for them and reaching out when they are vulnerable. When you notice it, when you pick up on something, that you engage them. That's something that if we don't get anything, you, you cannot check out as a parent. And I've told my daughters that. You know, sometimes it feels like overwhelming. You just want to check out sometimes because it's hard. But we, if we have kids, like, we have to be there. It's a full-time job until we go to the grave. You know, and they law make it easy and help us. But do not check out of your children's lives. Engage them. And build that trust so when it gets to a point where you have to restrict them from something, even if something they don't always get it and you're doing it just in spite of them themselves, because like I said, we're dealing with the big nuffs at the end of the day, build that trust. Work on building that relationship. It's not too late. That's, Zishan had asked the question, I guess somebody asked, um, how do I tell people that I don't have a phone? I, I've found that people surprisingly respect you for being different. They, we, we, it's our own insecurities, and we feel like, oh, we just want to fit in. We want to go under the radar. We don't want anyone to notice us. But more often than not, people respect you for being different. That's what American culture is all about, is really just being the maverick, being unique, doing your own thing. And so to just say with confidence, you know what? I don't have a phone, so you're going to have to email me that information for class, or you're going to have to give me a printout, or whatever it is, but being unapologetic about it. Um, that was one of the things uh, when our sons went to high school, and we told them that one thing I used to do back when I was in high school, which I realized doesn't work, and so we taught them a different tactic, that if somebody would ask me, like, why aren't you coming to the prom, or why don't you have a boyfriend, or why don't you drink, I would always answer, I can't drink, I can't date. I can't go to the prom. But what we taught our sons is to say, I don't drink. I don't date. I don't go to the prom. To say it as if it's a choice you're making. It's not something, be yeah, take ownership of it. And it's not something being put on you. And people, if, if you say, I can't, the reaction is, oh, you poor thing. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. Oh, your parents are such losers. But when you say, I don't, then it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. All right, well, let's see how we can work around it. That's something you don't do. And I have to respect that. Thank you. We, alhamdulillah, have received questions online and also here in the audience. So I'll read this one from the audience, inshallah. As someone who wants to be a parent one day, inshallah, how do you gently teach your kids about Islam? Especially in today's world, there are a lot of bad influences that can take us away from the deen. Anybody want to? So um, as far as the bad forces that can take uh, people away from the deen, uh, something that Am Amut Darif, who is a very respected scholar, uncle in the community here, uh, one of my friends asked him, you know, what do we do with all the 
horrific, horrible things that we see in the world that are going on around us that cause us to be afraid, cause us to worry for the sake of our children. What do we do about that? And he said something really interesting. He said, in every storm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, he's created an eye, the eye of the storm, right? Where everything's calm, everything's safe, nothing's flying around. He said, pray that Allah keeps you in the eye of the storm. So it's true. There are things going on all around us that are horrific. There's also a lot of beauty all around us as well, mashallah. And we pray to Allah um, every day, and our children see us praying for this as well, that Allah keeps us in his protection, keeps us in the eye of the storm. I mean, um, as far as how to gently teach the children about the deen, the children have to see a lot of joy in the practice of the deen. And they have to see that Islam works. They have to see that Islam gives you a dignified life, and it gives you a clean life, and it gives you a better option for a way of living than what others may be choosing all around them. And eventually, they will come to see the difference between right and wrong, because what's right has been presented in such a beautiful way to them their entire lives. So I, I had somebody once say, um, Well, I don't want to say anything that sounds like bragging. So we can be careful. Um, well, okay, I had somebody once say to me that um, you're one of the only happy Muslims I know. So, you know, and, and they were saying that's why they wanted me to speak at a public event. So they were like, you're a happy Muslim. You're a happy woman who's a Muslim. And I thought that was a very sad statement to make because why don't we look happy? Why, I know that we're worried about the next life and we're worried about how to get through this world in safety, Jala, but our deen gives us so much beauty and so much dignity and so much grace and so much hope. There's so much hope and there's so much beauty around us. So instead of just focusing on all the negative that's out there, also get our kids to see all the positive, right? So if kids see that Islam is the reason that parents treat each other with respect and Islam is the reason we smell nice and Islam is the reason our homes are clean, and Islam is the reason we treat our elders with respect. And Islam is the reason we pay our bills on time. Islam is the reason we keep our promises. They will eventually choose it for themselves, inshallah. We want them to choose it because they recognize that it's the al haq obviously. But when they also see that it gives you a dignified life, they will choose it for themselves, inshallah. And teach it with a smile. Beautiful. Sure. Again, sometimes the, the answer is in the question. So if the question for in this case is how to gently teach Islam, is be gentle. It's as simple as that. Be gentle. Don't teach them Islam. You know, yeah, being cranky. And, yeah, and it, should be a, it shouldn't be a bunch of no's. But you're, 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 and expose them to gentle people. Expose them to people that, exhibit the type of qualities that you personally admire and aspire to. And like I said, in this community, you have, like, when you think of, you know, a teacher or a gentle teacher, you know, expose them to a gentle teacher. All of us, I think, at this table have someone in mind. We think of, like, the gentle, smiling teacher. We all have someone in mind. When we think of, like, very, some of our teachers are very, like, jalali and majestic. They have a more serious tone. We have people in mind. So expose them to that. One of, one of the persons that, you know, just to make it very real and tangible, when I think of, is, is Dr. Rania. Masha, Dr. Rania Owad, may God preserve her and increase her in what he's blessed her with. Like, when she teaches, she has, like, an embedded smile. She's always smiling. And the interesting thing about that is I know one of, one of her teachers. And I used to live in the community where one of her teachers lives. And... She's constantly smiling to the extent that this particular uh, uh, female teacher that I'm talking about, she started actually wearing a niqab after some time. And every time I see her since she's even started wearing niqab, I still see her smiling through the niqab. Like you say, sometimes they say like their eyes are smiling. So even though she's, she's covering her smile even at this point, I still see it whenever I, I, I meet her. 
somewhere. She's still smiling. Her, her, the way she speaks is still like in a smiling tone. And that's made an impression on me to the extent that's why I'm talking about now. I see their smiles literally right now as I'm, as I'm talking to you. And next time you see Dr. Dr. Rania or you're at one of her sessions, take note of that. Like, wow, so between her sentences and while she's talking, there's always this smile. And that makes an impression on you. And sometimes it's, 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 it may sound strange, but sometimes you see their faces when you're thinking of, of doing something you shouldn't do. Sometimes there's been moments I'm thinking of doing something I know I shouldn't be doing, and I see the face of one of my teachers, and I'm just like, it's like for love. Like, it's, I feel embarrassed. You know? So sometimes, again, the, the answer is, is in the profession. So the Raising Children talk, uh, there was a Khalil Center introduction talk that was done at MCC. It's on the MCC East Bay uh, YouTube page, and it's Dr. Rania going through the four stages of child development. And there's one stage that's, uh, you know, the infant till two. There's two to six. There's six to nine. And then there's the age of a teenage. And then beyond that, and she talks about the hadith of Ali, uh, the saying of Ali, about the seven years, seven years, seven years. So if you want to uh, reference that, we can also link it um, to the page afterwards. But it, it's about child rearing and the child stages of development. Um, and she's a trained psychiatrist from Stanford, so she's also faculty at St. Louis. So. Just plugging her some more. All right, alhamdulillah. We have um, some more questions here. So another question um, for our panelists, and again, anybody feel free to jump in. And this is something that I know, too, happens a lot um, to our boys and girls, but I think especially with boys is the issue of bullying. So this particular question is, I get bullied and harassed at school all the time. My parents do not get how hard it is. I feel like I might be able to make a few friends at school, but my parents won't let me meet with my friends outside of school. They're overprotective and think only Muslims are good people. On weekends, we just go to their friends' dinner parties where they force me to get along with kids whom I don't even like. I am so stressed and lonely and don't know what to do. Okay, so probably a common problem, uh, I think, in the community. Anybody want to take it? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, growing up, growing up uh, here, having friends um, is very difficult. Uh, it's very, it's, it's a question that, that speaks to my heart. I actually felt that way quite a bit. Um, again, I was raised pre-9-11, not post-9-11, so I'm sure things are ramped up quite a bit with 9-11 and then ISIS and then now the killings in uh, in in uh, New Zealand, and there's been killing. I mean, it's just ramping up, so I'm sure it's getting quite uh, quite intense. And uh, I remember Sean uh, uh, talking to us, and he didn't tell us at the time what was happening, but he said that once the ISIS uh, video came out, where where the guy uh, I think s beheaded or slit the throat of of a journalist, uh, one of his friends, you know, teased him and said, "Oh, are you gonna?" They had a little disagreement. They said, oh, "Are you gonna slit my throat now?" You know, so it's, it's not just bullying, it's just this constant sort of psychological teasing that goes on all day. And I think as parents now, we have to really understand what our children are going through. They're going through a very stressful life. We're going through a very stressful life trying to raise them. And we have to be really, really good partners. Uh, we're one team, and we're not going to survive without being great teammates. So um, talking about this issue, I, I felt very, very lonely. And... Um, what it, what it did, what I did was I was I kind of shut down. I shut down, stopped communicating. My relationship with my parents deteriorated because we weren't connecting. Um, I felt alone. Uh, I had some good friends. We played outside a lot, so that that's kind of saved me. But this was definitely going on in my brain. And then the same thing is a lot of our family friends. They had you know little girls. I was the only boy. My sister, and then all these little girls. And I didn't have anywhere to go. I didn't have any friends. So um, it was it was a period of loneliness. And what I would say is to try to have your son, A, um, do, do Taekwondo, do sports, that gets them out and gets them friends that are connected. Because the, f the best way for children, or boys especially, is to connect on a team. And once they share a ball, they start becoming friends. And I think with uh, girls, it might be a little bit more complicated. And Brother Harun could speak to that. So number one is uh, get them activities that get them connected to other people. And when they want to have friendships, you know, in the park, sports days, things like that that you can do, or maybe even if you find 
one or two good children that you think are good friends, have them in your home under your watch with your children. So they can see that Islam works in the home and their friends are there. They can watch a movie night that you can approve of, things that they can do together. Try to build that friendship for your children. You can't leave them just shutting down. So there has to be, the parent has to find a way to, to, to answer this question for the child, which is give them friendship and give them camaraderie that they can, that, that both the parent and the child are happy with. And it may not happen overnight. Uh, also connecting them with good young girls, good older people who are going to take them out, take care of them. Um, I, I would say that, that that needs to be done. But this is something that the parents, um, I, would, I, would, I would say the parents need to work with this child to, to fulfill those needs. Fulfill those needs. Because um, uh, it's a very serious problem. And the, and, and the child needs, needs help. Because you can't, you can't grow up in a vacuum like that. Yeah, just saying no is not going to work. It didn't work with me. It shut me out. Um, uh, it, it caused a lot of different problems because once I was out of the house, uh, I fulfilled those needs different ways. Because that those needs go somewhere, and then you have to um, adjust your life, and it sends you on a different track. So you want to help that child, and you know, just religion and all that stuff is not going to work. You have to teach them aqidah, teach them love of the Prophet, and give them good friends. Whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, there's a lot of good kids out there in sports and, uh, and other activities support them. It's also easy to, to think about the danger of the non-Muslim uh, friends, which obviously I'm sis, sis, you know, sensitive about because there was a point in time where I was not classified as a Muslim, and I still thought I was a pretty decent guy, you know. <laughs> I was liked by my friends' parents and considered a pretty respectful guy. But um, there's also Muslim friends who can be an even bigger problem than the non-Muslim friends. Because usually the biggest harm is the harm that comes from within, within your own self and within your own community. So still the solution or one of the remedies uh, to both is, is still being engaged. Regardless, it's not just, okay, I want you to have no non-Muslim friends, blah, blah, blah. No, it's okay if you find that they have an interest in associating with someone, invite them over. You know, one of the easiest ways to get to know somebody is through a plate of food. Invite them over, feed them, see what they're about, engage their friends. Don't just let the friends come in the house and they run off upstairs to the room, shut the door, or run to the basement, shut the door. No, when they come in, you know, you got to check out. I mean, that's even one of our jobs as parents is you're supposed to be the guardian of your door. You know, you just don't let anybody come in the house. Somebody's coming in the house. Oh, who is this? How are you doing? What you into? That's always one of my favorite questions to ask you is what are you into? Okay, because usually that gives me some insight into their personality. But also it gives an opportunity to expose them to what you're about, the values of your household. You know, there's households that still stick out for me, for my youth, that I went to that. Every time I went to so-and-so's house, I was treated well. You know, they fed me, they looked after me. If anything was going home, you know, anything was going wrong, I knew I could talk to so-and-so's dad. I knew I could talk to so-and-so's mom. I knew if I was locked out of my house, I could go to so-and-so's house. Okay, so definitely beware in general. And again, engage. Don't check out. Just don't assume, oh, my son has a halo or my daughter has a hijab and a hijab is a halo or a force field. It doesn't work like that. Okay? But be engaged. Check into these people. Check into things. Invite them. Ask them questions. Not just to be the nosy, nagging parent, but even find things that you all may have in common that you enjoy doing together. It's funny. One of my sons was telling me about one of his best friends and who I'm getting to know. They, they became really close over the last year. And I was asking him what he really likes about this other young man. I like him too, mashallah, but I wanted to know what my son liked about him. And he said, you know, he's the only, he's one of those few people that he's the same in front of adults that he is in front of kids. And he's the same with us as he is in front of our parents. And that kind of gave me a little bit of an inside look that I just assumed all his friends were what, how I saw them, you know, but that comment showed me that, you know, you may think somebody's perfect, or you may think somebody needs some work, but you don't really know what the full story is, right? 
So, um, but never underestimate the power of dua. Do a lot of dua for your children to have good friends and for you to have good friends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings them from out of the blue once you start asking him for good sahaba, inshallah. Thank you, mashallah. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, so I, we're, we're kind of, um, we've been going, mashallah, for a, a while now. I don't know, the conversation's been so fluid. I don't think, it, it just dawned on me that we've been speaking for an, almost an hour and a half straight. So I'm going to ask uh, the audience members, do you guys want to continue and uh, just sort of skip the break, or do you feel like you want to get up and stretch a little bit? Maybe you want to stretch? Yeah, show of hands if you, if you think we should take a break. Okay, so the, the brothers are like, oh, this is too much talking for us. Um, no, 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 I'm just teasing. Okay, then maybe we can just take a little bit, five, ten minute break. And please listen out because we will ask you to come back in just to wrap up and have some, uh, some address a few more questions. Seven years, and then you're their friend for the third seven years. And then you let them go. So your friends from 14 to 21. I, this goes directly in line with that hadith. Um, how you answer that question really depends on what you've been doing up until the age of 14, like what you've been teaching your children. And then based on what you've been teaching them, then you have your response to this situation. And hearing about uh, this particular scenario where a parent found out about her son, son having a non-Muslim girlfriend in high school, uh, I know of two people, two different situations, exact same thing. Uh, one family, the son has a girlfriend, and the other family, the son had a girlfriend, and the parents found out about it. So family A, the mother told me, and, it, and I witnessed this myself and had seen it uh, the entire time the kids were growing up, they did not teach their children the religion. They did not teach their children uh, fiqh and sharia was not a priority in the home. Um, and so the mother admitted that she was disappointed that that was a choice her son made, and now he's even living with his girlfriend. He's in college, but they're a Muslim family. Um, the mother said that I kind of feel like my hands are tied. My husband and I did not teach our children the deen at all, so how can I now tell him that he needs to fear Allah or that this is a sin or that it's haram? So fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. The other family, I, I learned a lot from their situation. So... The, the other family actually always taught their children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they taught their kids about fiqh and sharia and what Allah's rights are and what the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is. And they themselves followed the rules of the religion in the home. Despite all that, the son um, took a, a, a girlfriend in high school and the mom found out about it. The parents found out about it. And I learned a lot from their response. Um, what the mother told me they did is they sat their son down and they said, okay, so here you have a girlfriend. And um, they had found out from um, siblings in the family had, had let out the secret. And the son confirmed it, that he did ha indeed have a girlfriend. And so the mom said, okay, well, what are we going to do about this? Because you know that even though she's not Muslim, she has rights. Your girlfriend has rights. And I'm not going to ask you like how far you've taken your relationship with her. I'm just going to ask you, how now do you want to make this relationship halal? And he was in high school. He was 16 years old. And the son's like, well, what do you mean, make it halal? And the mom's like, well, you know that we, in Islam, that there's no premarital relations. And if you've decided that this girl is important to you and important enough that you're going to cross this line, then we need to do what we need to do to make it halal. And here are the options. Your dad and I can go to Mr. and Mrs. Smith's home and uh, we will give a marriage proposal on your behalf. And the son was horrified. <laughs> horrified. He's like, what are you talking about? And the mom was like, I know their address. So this is not a problem. And she was actually speaking very respectfully to her son. And she said that, I know their address, and we can go and have a talk with the parents and explain that you're Muslim, and we've raised you Muslim, and these are the rules of our religion. And she said to her son, don't worry, honey. This is, you don't have to live together. You don't have to be a husband and wife the way your mom and dad are husband and wife. You just have to make your relationship halal. 
And if you decide to break up with her, then you're going to pay her her meher, and she's going to have her rights fulfilled, and then you guys will go your separate ways. But she needs to know that she has rights according to our religion. You're not going to hide that from her. And so the parents made it about, really about compassion and caring towards other people. And she said, I know that in you know, other religions or other cultures, it's okay. Boys and girls can get together before marriage and do whatever they want. And they can have their hearts broken and there's no justice and everyone goes on. But in our religion, we have rules. And so the son was like, obviously not going for that. He was completely terrified at the idea of his parents showing up to his girlfriend's home with the marriage proposal. And, and the mom even painted a, like a lovely scenario. She's like, you'll be able to go to the prom with her. You know, you'll be able to do all the things that you want to do. You don't have to do it behind our backs. And the community can know about it. it, will, it nobody will say that, oh, look, Mr. and Mrs. Muhammad's son is, has a girlfriend behind their backs and they don't know this. Will, we will have dignity. We will have respect. She like painted it as something that was actually doable. But what she did tell her son was she said, you have, uh, let me see if I remember this correctly. She said, you have three options. She said, one, you can end the relationship with your girlfriend and there are going to be tears and it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. It's going to hurt her. It's going to hurt you. But in the end, you'll be choosing Allah, and you will be choosing to do the right thing and have a halal relationship by breaking up. You can choose to get married and then continue doing what you're doing right now, but it will be out in the open, and it will be approved by Allah, and it will be halal. Or the third is you can choose something that is going to take you to the hellfire. And she was very, very blunt with her language. She didn't say, you're going to choose something, we're going to cut you off, we're going to have nothing to do with you, and we disown you. She said, you, will, you can choose something that is going to take you to the hellfire because you will be committing haram. And she's like, we have always taught you the rules of our religion. These are your three options in front of you. And she told him, um, she had this talk with him, and then her husband had a talk with him. She said, we're going to give you a week to decide. And he said, okay, I need a week. He said, I'm, I'm not going to just give you the answer you want right now. And she's like, that's fine. And she, they set a date. They set a time. They went out for brunch. And she said, in a week, we're going to go out to brunch. And you let us know what you want to do, and we will facilitate. And he was not happy about it. He met with them a week later, and he accepted that he was going to end the relationship. And it was not easy. Um, the mom told me there were a lot of tears and after the son uh, ended the relationship with his girlfriend, the mom cried with him. She cried with him, which blew me away because I was trying to think about how I would react if this was my situation. And I don't know if I would have had that kind of empathy or sympathy. I think I would have been like, this serves you right. This is what you got yourself into. Now deal with the, the repercussions or the feelings. But mashallah, this mom had a lot of compassion. And she held her son as he wept because it was so hard for him. But what I loved about that example that I saw was she empowered him to make the right decision. But it was only possible after a whole lifetime of showing that this is where the buck stops. We, everything ends at sharia and fiqh and what Allah expects of us. If you haven't been doing that your entire life, then, all, then it's like the family A, the, the first family I told about. They... Their hands are tied. What, what can they tell their kid now about what he can and can't do when they've never said anything before? Right? Thank you. Jazakallah khair. And that was a wonderful response, mashallah, for all of us, I'm sure, to reflect on. Um, I just wanted to make a point, though, about the family that does feel like, uh oh, is it too late? for my family. Because sometimes, you know, parents um, may, may not have been doing a lot of these things in the beginning with their children, but at some point, you know, reality hits and they realize I have to catch up on my parenting. Um, is all hope lost? No. Um, and if you find yourself in a situation where you haven't been really teaching the, your children Dean and, and a lot of these things are kind of now coming to uh, the surface and you want to reestablish your relationship with your children, I think having really open, honest communication is the key. Um, as, as we've talked about throughout the panel, uh, speaking from your own perspective and, and vulnerability and actually admitting your own shortcomings and your own 
feelings is a wonderful, amazing way for you to connect with your teens. And I can say that as someone who works a lot with teens. And one of the issues that is very common in our communities and in, or in our community and many of our cultures is this idea that parents never show weakness to their children. And they are always, uh, they don't even apologize in some cases. I mean, I, I've spoken with parents and teens where the teen will tell me, in, with the parents standing there, that my parents never apologize for anything even when they make mistakes. And this is a really big um, problem in our community. We have to get over this sort of ego, very self-centered type of parenting. We are all in the same boat. Our children are really, I think, I mean, Allah knows, but in throughout history, I, can, I feel like the issues that they deal with are unprecedented. We really got the easy you know, path. I, I, I'm so grateful that I'm not a teen. I really am. I, I swear, when I when I hear what they go through and I see what they're up against, I'm like, Ya Allah, thank you for saving me from the insanity that our poor children have inherited. So we have to be more empathic, more sympathetic to what they're going through. And the only way that we can receive, uh, or that, that we can, um, you know, have more open communication is for us to kind of, you know, be be humble a little bit, bring ourselves down, admit that, you know what, I didn't do, I, my priorities were maybe off the first five, six, seven, ten years, fifteen years of your life. I'm sorry, I was career oriented. I had this going on, that going on, and maybe I didn't give you the attention that you deserve. Maybe I wasn't interested in what you were doing. I'm so sorry if I felt if if I because of my distractions or my other, you know, lack of maybe focus, I didn't make you feel important enough, but I want to redo that. Can I reset that, please? Let you know and, and start from that place of owning what you didn't do that should have been done as a parent. And then asking for a, a, re, a renewal of your relationship. I feel like children would probably really much more uh, respect you and actually really see you in a different light if we were to do that more as parents, as opposed to uh, letting the distance continue and and you know just the the relationship. Because a, a lot of parents feel like, well, there's nothing I can do. The doors are slamming in my face. Um, you know, I've lost my child, and it's my fault. And they kind of think. Uh, hope, you know, I, there's no hope. No, that's from shaitan. It's waswasa. There's always hope with Allah. We are not a religion of despair. We're a religion of hope. And it sometimes it does come down to something so basic as you apologizing and saying, I am sorry. I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm human. I failed. But I love you enough to want to have a redo. Please join me in this. And, and, and just from there, inshallah. So yeah, one of the issues is, you know, I didn't do X, Y, and Z for so many years, and now I want to, my kid, and to to do, to do, uh, you know, start praying and this and that. And so for someone who's um, lost his way and came back to Islam pretty late, I feel like I took Shahada in my heart uh, with Sheikh Hamza at one of his talks when I was, you know, well into my adulthood. I feel like that's when Islam came back to me, um, and so. It's exactly what Sister Hussai just mentioned, which is the real gen and uh, Brother Harden mentioned. Really gently say to your child and your family, "This is where we're at, and this is how we didn't do it, and now we want to move forward together, together." And I want you by my side, and I want you to uh, learn the Deen with me because I didn't do it, and so um, you know. I, again, it's the forty-day lesson. They're not going to all everybody like, okay, yeah, let's go, and pick a, pick a topic. Say, either we're going to go to a talif, or either we're going to go to a conference, or either we're going to go to a speech, or something that advances our deen so that we can all learn. So uh, Hazrat Ibrahim s spoke to Allah, but then there's an ayah in Surah Baqarah where he still wanted to know, he still wanted to increase his yaqeen. And Allah said to him, you still don't believe, uh, 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 Hazrat Musa, sorry, you still don't believe? And then he said, take four birds and train them, and then cut them into little pieces and put them on four parts of the mountain and call them. And he, Allah brought them to life and they all came back to him. And because, it was Ibrahim, okay, sorry. I'm not a scholar. We did that pleasure. So anyway, um, but the, the point is, is that even, even the prophets had wanted to taste yaqeen better than they had it before. And you go up and down. We're up and down. Your prayer in, in the afternoon is different from your prayer in the morning. And so you have to engage your children and say, let's do this journey together. Let's go somewhere. And then watch them. I can see with my children which 
event they like and which one they're bored at. Okay, you know, let's go to this conference. And there's going to be some place where they like it. And then go there with them. Give them what they need and get what you need. Inshallah together. It's never too late. That answer is actually really perfect, and it goes well with a question that we got online that I'm just going to read. Um, I'm moving from an area with a relatively good Muslim community to one with a high school that has absolutely no Muslim youth in that high school. How do I get my son to be a proud Muslim in that environment where he will be the lone Muslim in the school? So just to piggyback off of what um, Zishan was saying, it's so important that we engage our kids in, in these types of community activities and actually grow an attachment to our community centers, our masajids. I cannot um, emphasize, emphasize that enough. The research shows that kids that are actually uh, attached to their religious community center um, are protected from, I believe there's six uh, high, high risk uh, behavior of teens that, fall, that they fall into. But when you see kids that are you know, attached to their religious institutions, they're protected from those things. So it's even if they're in a high school situation, a public high school, or they're, you know, um, most of their uh, friends might not be Muslim, by giving them something regular, not like, you know, Eid only, Ramadan only, or certain, you know, times where, because it's convenient for you, but actually giving them a sense of, of uh, belonging to a community uh, center or masjid that's close to you or classes or something, but regularly feeding that. It has to be regular. Um, it, it will really, really help uh, firm, con, you know, confirm their identity, strengthen their identity, and inshallah help uh, to also repair the, uh, for, for those, again, families that have, are maybe getting a late start into this path, it'll help repair uh, some of these, you know, the issues that, that, that you're experiencing by having a place for your team to, uh, to go to, to maybe talk, to develop relationships with other people, find mentors, uh, and learn from other people. There's so many. I mean, here in the Bay, mashallah, we have honestly nothing to complain about. We have in every corner that you can go to. There's really no excuse. And then for, for places like MCC, may Allah reward the organizers here because they not only provide these types of programming, but then they also allow for people to be in the comfort of their own home watching these things. But we, we have to keep it regular is my point. Don't just um, uh, you know underestimate the value of bringing your kids to the Friday youth, uh, for example, halakas here, or bringing them to p panels like this, or any type of events that are targeted for youth. Make it a priority. Look at the newsletters. Plan it in your schedule. Skip going to the movies, please. Like you could do that any day now with Netflix and all that stuff. Prioritize your life, and that's one of the rules that I always tell my children about um, in terms of of, of our practice. That uh, for us. Our lives are completely planned around our, our deen. And I take that very seriously. So our prayers come first. No matter what I'm doing, I have to know where am I going to pray? Are we going to be able to make wudu? We'll you know, that's how I work, and that's how they now work. But we do, unfortunately, the opposite a lot of times. We plan everything else. We're very good at planning social activities. We plan a lot of fun things. But we don't think about deen and how important it is to, you know, what are we created for? Why are we here? So our prayers have to be our priority. Our children's identity has to be our priority in our life. Forget all the other stuff. If it's distracting you from that objective, it's, it's really, again, in our hands to make sure that they know that these are priorities, that being Muslim and living Islam, not just being you know, nominally Muslim or you know, like a, you know, Muslim during, during different seasons of the year, but we actually have a way of life that we commit to. And that is where, again, being active in your community center and masjid and regularly bringing them uh, is really, really key, inshallah. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to add one thing before I hand it over. So we were talking during the break, right, about just do not underestimate the importance and the value of the village. The village is very, very important in raising our children in, in this day and age. We, we can't have little bubbles or little shelters that's just not possible in today's society but we can have communities of like-minded people like-minded families where your kids know that they even if they feel like they're alone or they feel like they're the strange ones in school they know that they have a network of support or a community that gets them even if they're not best friends with everyone that we're, we all kind of get each other and we get what our struggles are and 
I know of a few people who, mashallah, we've been raising our kids now in the Bay Area for the past 21, 22 years. And I've seen a lot of different types of parenting styles come and go and a lot of different choices that my friends have made as parents. And I have a few friends who are, you know, introverts. They didn't like going out in the community. They didn't like socializing. And they would make these choices when the kids were younger to forego big community things or gatherings because they preferred being just home with their family or just with their kids. And, okay, that seemed fine. Like, I didn't know what was right or wrong. That, if that works for you, good enough. But what I'm seeing now with some of those families is now that their kids are older and they're in college, it is much easier for those families that didn't choose to engage with the village, with the Muslim community, it's much easier for those kids to check out. It's easier for those kids to go their own way. They don't feel like they're disappointing anyone. They don't feel like they're leaving anybody. They don't feel like they're shaming themselves. There's no one they're really accountable to. Obviously, we don't want to live our lives thinking, what will people say? What will people say? But there is a value to having a community and a village that goes beyond just your parents who you are you know, accountable to. You, you want them to like you and respect you and... and um, and consider you when it comes time to getting married, that they will consider you for their sons and daughters. So these are things to think about. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the, I'm still thinking about the, the parent trying to figure out a, whether now they're moving a place where they don't have that village that we have here, mashallah, like in such abundance. And I really feel for that situation. And, and one of the things I, I wrote down uh, when I heard that question was pray for it way for it. So pray for it and make a way for it. Um, just because that is the situation doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. If you're going to this, this community and they don't have a, a thriving uh, Muslim community there, perhaps well, you should make that intention to be that spark in that community. And most likely at this point, with the, the growth of Muslim families here in America, most likely in that high school, I'm sure there's probably one other Muslim at and so you go there and do a little investigative work, you know, find out, you know, from the administrators about the Muslim population or other Muslim students. There may already be existing activities that you're just not aware of yet because you're not there in that community just yet. But also be proactive yourself along with your, your son or daughter, I can't remember what it, what it is, to initiate those things. Um, initiate a relationship with uh, staff there at the school that, okay, if they can have a, this particular room to pray in, you know, if need be. And then you never know, just by doing that, that now you have other Muslim students kind of like all of a sudden appear, you know, that you didn't even realize that they existed. But now that you've made this opportunity for your child, it becomes a magnet opportunity uh, for, for other people's children. And one of the things that I realized is even in talking with my children is that it's only in terms of like practicing Islam and making it work here with the particular responsibilities that we have, such as the prayer, is it's only as awkward as you make it a lot of times. And one of the things that we do, we know we're going to be out and about. And so we know that we have a very beautiful understanding in our religion that prayer is actually light. Prayer is a source of light. And the places where we pray, where we make that sejda, it leaves a mark. You know, that will testify on our behalf on the day of judgment that worship and remembrance of God was established in that mark. And so it's nice to know, like, on the way coming here, we passed by the, the shopping center where the Hacienda Theater is. We've been to that theater. But like the sister said, we schedule it around prayer times. And we literally, like, I feel good knowing that we left the prayer mark in that shopping center on several different spots in that parking lot. Like, okay, we left the prayer mark. And so I tell my, my daughters when I, you know, I have a lot of slogans in the house <laughs> just to help make principles easy to memorize, but that's just one of them. You know, it's only as awkward as you make it. And so be creatively righteous. That's one of the things I say. We have to be creatively righteous. We can establish these prayers. They always tell me stories of, you know, leaving a, you know, having to pray in the Nordstrom, Nordstrom's dressing room, you know. All kinds, like I said, I mean, how many parking lots, you know, are you going to end up praying in? Balconies, all these different places you end up praying, we can do it. We can establish it, and it's only as hard as we make it. Sometimes there's just a lot of fears we put in our own hearts. It's like, okay, right here, this is going to be awkward. 
not I'm not saying you got to get up in the middle of the movie theater and go down. Usually there's a platform down in front. You go down on the platform yeah, and pray right there. Yeah, and give the advance. <laughs> You know, and go pray, but make it work. There's times Miriam is right here as a witness. We sometimes the timing is falling to prayer time. We even set, okay, this is where we're gonna pray. And we pray right there. We get up, right? And we even take turns, pray on a relay so we don't lose our seats and stuff. Have we done that? Right? We've gone in corners in theaters and pray right inside the theater. And so far we're still alive. Nobody said anything, nobody kicked us out of the theater. So again, you have to look at it in the positive. Don't always take the responsibilities as a negative. Oh, we gotta pray. No, we're leaving marks of light across the earth. We're making sejda marks of light on the earth that Allah was worshiping you. In a theater, you remembered Allah in a theater? We may have been that only person. You know, I always think about that. We go to certain places. We may be the only people in this mall, in this wherever, who remember God. That's why the dua that you say when going into the marketplace is so huge, right? When you go to a mall, you should, there's a specific dua. I'm not even going to tell you what it is because I want you to look it up yourself. That you should make. Don't we say that dua when we go to the store? Go to Safeway, Target, we come in the door, make the dua. Because it's huge because this is a place where people aren't thinking about God. They're just thinking about what they want to get for themselves, okay? And that's something I appreciate as a convert is that Allah has helped us to remember him. And sometimes you just feel so tongue-tied. Like, what am I supposed to say to God? I know I'm supposed to think of God. What do I say? He just gives us all these things to say. What to say when you get up. What to say when you go to the restroom. What to say when you put on your clothes. What to say before you eat. What to say when you leave the house. What to say when you get in your mode of transportation. What to say when you go to the store. What to say when you enter into a, a, a house of worship. What to say when you leave. What to say when you leave the bathroom. Right? What to say when you greet someone? All these different duas is like we can definitely get out of there. Okay, and again, it's it's we should take an empowering and a, and a positive attitude. This is awesome. I can talk to God with His own words. Right, His own words. Of course, He's going to hear that and love that. So a lot of times, it's only as awkward as we make it. So we have to to find creative solutions to some of our challenges. But be we are the Jedi in the world of Sith. We believe in the Force. Allah. Mashallah. Mashallah, you bring such a beautiful perspective, especially uh, I think for many of us who are born into this faith, we sometimes lose that zeal and that appreciation for all of the beautiful things that Sidi Hadron mentioned. I'm always in awe of converts. Uh, who this language, uh, Arabic especially, is not easy for a lot of them to learn. And yet, mashallah, if he can sit there and commit and commit his family to learning these du'as and many others, there's so many examples of people who strive because they really do see the value in these things. And they look at it with that eye of like, wow, this is a, a true gift from Allah. For so, some of us, because maybe we heard it our whole lives, the Quran was playing, or we know these du'as from childhood, we've, we lo we've lost that sort of just um, awe and appreciation. But we, we should recapture that and I think that's part of you know really going back and making our, our tradition very personal instead of just you know looking back on what we did as, as children and kind of you know having that 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 sort of experience when you personalize your path with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you go to it with a very renewed eye and you start um, seeing things the way mashallah that that you know him and so many other people who come to this deen see it which is really like wow these are treasures so jazakallah khairan um um, I really think you need a book because I want to. I want to know all of your sayings and slogans. I personally will. I seriously would buy that book in a second. Um, mashallah, if you don't follow Sidi Hadron, he's a poet. He's an artist. He's he's so talented in so many ways. Very very humble. But follow him on Facebook because sometimes the gems he drops are just mashallah mind mind blowing. So jazakallah khairan. I wanted to just get back to some of the questions that we've received. We we received another uh, one online that Brother Zishan mentioned earlier, but he uh, mentioned the second half. Now I'd like to actually read the first half, and it does tie into a lot of this, uh, what we've just been talking about as far as identity. I am all set to wear hijab, but there's one question holding me back. What if something happens to me when I wear hijab? My mom. What if someone judges me for wearing it or someone hurts me for wearing it? I am the only one. Okay, so I know that, um, I mean, I have some comments on this, but I'm going to 
turn to my panelists, anybody? You know? Yeah, mashallah. I'm going to turn to my fellow female panelists. <laughs> I think it's natural to feel anxiety and to feel some fear, uh, especially in today's political climate, when going out wearing anything that visibly identifies you as a Muslim. Um, but I think it's really, really important to remind ourselves of the concept of the Qadr of Allah, which is that what hits you was never going to miss, and what misses you was never going to hit. That we as Muslims actually believe that. We believe that whatever is going to hit us, it's because Allah willed it, and there was no way it was going to miss us. And whatever misses us was never going to hit us, no matter how much we may even have wanted it. And the truth is that you can be harassed whether you're wearing hijab or not. And we're all going to die one day whether we're wearing hijab or not. So that the fear of what if is really something that shaitan does with us to, to get us to put off doing something that we want to do for the sake of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever uh, step we take towards Allah, we should believe that he's going to come running towards us in response. And we should ask Allah to protect us because he's the ultimate protector. right? And when it's our time to go, what more beautiful way could there be to go than to go as a Muslim visibly identifiable as a Muslim. After the Christchurch tragedy, I, I do not pray to go to leave this world in an act of violence. I, I don't want to die a violent death. But at the same time, I really um, envied, if I can use that word in a positive sense, not that I was jealous of them, but envied the, the people who were martyred that day, that they were martyred for being Muslim. They, they were going to leave this world one way or the other. But to leave as Muslims, to leave because of their faith, um, on Jama, in, in a state of wudu, in a state of prayer, the last act being an act of worship. Um, Alhamdulillah, there were so many lessons to be taken from, from what happened in Christ Church, even, even the name Christ Church. SubhanAllah. But um, trust in Allah. Trust in Allah. He's the ultimate protector. No one else can protect us but him. So, so we're, we're living in a world now where people are shaving their heads and tatting themselves out like crazy. And, uh, you know, I ride the train every day to work, work in San Francisco, work in the corporate world. It's, it's every now and then a muhajiba will get on the train and, or walk in downtown San Francisco. And I'm telling you, it's not because I'm Muslim. It's, 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 it's like a person of light. Um, people are disfiguring themselves, uh, self-mutilating, uh, pink hair, all kinds of weird stuff. It's like this freedom that's gone amok. And it really shows out when someone is protected and protecting themselves, protecting their modesty, and protecting their beauty, and protecting their gaze, and they know where they're walking. They're not distracted. Um, and I see this lady sit on BART every now and then. She'll do her word in the morning. And I'm just, you know, I'm ready to, I'm ready to, if anyone says anything, I'm ready to kill someone if someone says something to her. So there's people, someone around, you know, there's Muslims around you that are going to, mashallah, step up because you, we know you look Muslim. And I don't look Muslim, you know, when I'm on the train. So we're there. We're there. And, um, you know, I just think it's very, very amazing to wear that. It's like a crown now. It's, re it's really like a crown. And, and, and I listen to uh, other um, issues with, with men and women and feminism and things like that. Men are being turned off by that, by, by that masculinity and that hardness that some women want to have now. So you stand out in terms of beauty. So I just thought I would share that. Um, I think you know, it came to my brain as, as I was listening to the question. Um, but it is, it is a struggle. It's a fight. And we don't have to wear that crown. You know, I don't have to wear a kufi. So I definitely understand the fear and, and the anxiety that's there. One of the things, as, again, as a convert, um, hijab was something that was very fascinating to me. And um, I, had, I, would, I, had the, I had seen nuns. You know, I, was, I was in the Baptist tradition. And so covering really wasn't part of Baptist. Christian practice, 
but you know, obviously we all were aware of nuns. And so when I became Muslim, I was like, oh, cool. It's like I can marry a nun. You know, that was something I really thought was like really honorable and really high. And I was like, wow, what's that going to be like being married to a nun? And am I really of that caliber? I can be married to a nun. And, and that was that was just my under, my view of it. But it's very beautiful. We have a very beautiful understanding about this in our tradition in, in, the, in the Hadith and paraphrase that Allah has a hijab. You know, he doesn't wear a hijab, but we are told in, in one of the narrations that Allah has a hijab, meaning a, a type of barrier, and it's made of light. His, his hijab is light. And so I was at SubhanAllah, like, everyone, you know, all these women who have taken that on as part of their practice, it literally is a source of light. And you should take inspiration from the light. Allah, and, and see your hijab literally as light. I am wearing light. And I have no doubt that that's, inshallah, how you're going to see that, you know, on that day is, is as light. Well, another thought came to me. Did you guys all see the pictures of the New Zealand women, the newscasters, and everybody who put on hijab? Did you notice how different they looked? The same women, when they put on hijab, all the ladies seemed elevated. It was weird. I mean, I, 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 I asked you to go back and look at those pictures, but that immediately came to my mind that they look more elegant, they look more elevated, they look more um, distinguished with the hijab on. It, it was just amazing to see that. And that's part of the, the martyrdom and that Allah shows us that, that Islam can show this thing to people even in the midst of a, an amazing tra uh, uh, midst of a tragedy. You can have these amazing epiphanies and things going on. So anyway, I just noticed that about the women when I, when I saw those pictures. Thank you so much. It's always really nice to hear uh, our brothers supporting uh, sisters uh, because and in, in, in relating to them, even though that they can't necessarily relate in, in, the, in the wearing of the hijab, but they still do observe certain things and, and are able to, uh, to support us. So Jazakallah khairan. <laughs> There you go. Exactly. You don't wear hijab, but inshallah, the beard is the hijab, right? Or the, is a substitute. <laughs> it does. I agree. So wait, it's not a real website? I think it, it, someone needs to buy that domain. We need to get that rolling. <laughs> Just not go ahead. MashaAllah, we've received some really great uh, follow-up questions from the audience. Thank you so much for turning these in. Um, this one is, a, I think, a really important one, and I personally have heard this time and time again. How important is it for both the parents uh, to be on the same page in terms of religious values, like hijab, praying during travel, for example? Um, I mean, obviously, MashaAllah, uh, it's that's an ideal situation that you have um, harmony in the household and everybody's on the same page. But even if that's not the case, and I know from speaking to a lot of these sisters in the community that many of them do struggle with this very di dynamic where they may be wanting to uh, really, you know, have a, a more you know sound Islamic household, but the, the resistance isn't coming necessarily from the children; it's from their partner. Um, even if that's the case, I think, uh, and it can be vice versa, sometimes it's vice versa. Um, I think maintaining your own practice and uh, really creating that bond with your children um, and just being in this, having a spirit of love and compassion and, and instead of harping on rules and being really sort of militant in terms of practice. And, you know, um, I had someone actually uh, just, I think, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, I've kind of been that I'm doing a few different events this week, but someone did ask me about prayer and like how that they can approach the topic of prayer um, with their family members and not come across like they're, you know, micromanaging other people's practice. And I just said, you know, we have to, this is where thinking outside the box a little bit and really coming up with creative ways to, as um, I believe uh, Sidi Harun and I think all the panelists mentioned, having Islam being a group activity. If it's like everybody kind of fend for themselves and then there's one, you know, uh, sort of drill sergeant who's going to go around with a, you know, um, uh, what is it called, a clipboard and, and kind of check off what everybody's doing, that's not a good spirit in the household. We shouldn't do that to each other where we're checking in on each other. But if you kind of make it a collective 
uh, experience where everybody mutually benefits and you want to do things together as a family. And that's the spirit with which you approach the topic of, let's say, prayer, for example. Like, I, I really think it's very, very important that families pray together. But let's say, and this is advice I've given to sisters before, if you are, uh, you know, wanting to establish prayer in the household and with your family, but your husband isn't quite there yet, instead of making him feel bad and like, you know, there's something wrong with him and we're all praying and you don't, I think it's really important sometimes to boost the morale um, uh, of your spouse and remind him of his own, you know, uh, importance in the family and the fact that he is uh, given the imam, you know, the, the role of imam in the household and to honor and uplift. Whenever we speak with language like that, I feel like it's really, and even if he doesn't agree the first time because maybe he's engaged in something or he doesn't have wudu and it's inconvenient for him, just keep coming with those types of positive reinforcing messages. Like, you know, we look to you, the children look to you, the boys, you know, they, we want to hear your beautiful recitation. Whatever it is that will somehow spark, uh, a, you know, an interest in the activity instead of just guilt and, you know, kind of creating a, a rift where we're the practicing good ones and you're the one that's still behind. You're, you know, you're engaged in this X, Y, and Z haram or whatever it is. Don't do that. Create that spirit of family and love and a connectivity. And remember, you know, there are, I mean, that's, like I said, going back to um, my awe of a lot of our convert Muslims, may Allah bless them. Some of these people in their own homes, they have to deal with people who not only don't practice the faith, and many times they reject the faith altogether, but they still have the sense to know, to be able to create harmony in their family and, and not cause division because they, they, they know what it is to be on the other side. So sometimes you have to remember, you know, guidance is from Allah. Sometimes people become wayward because of things that you might not understand, but not to become self-righteous when it comes to Dean and think like, well, I'm better than this person because I practice and I do this and I, you know, I, I know better and my spouse doesn't or my relative doesn't. Just remember we're all on this journey together and people get, you know, pulled this way or that way, but the best way to keep them tethered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tethered to this Dean is through compassion and love. Keep that always on your tongue. Speak with love and just bring them in that way, but not, not. Uh, yeah, of course, please, Bismillah. Um, it's not really, it's not super crucial that the husband and wife have exactly the same interests or the same personalities or even the same ways of teaching their children. What's really, really important, however, is that the husband and wife have the same goals for their children, that they have the same goals for what kind of Muslims they want to raise, and how they want their children to turn out, inshallah. So this is a discussion that has to happen between husband and wife privately about what are our goals for our children, what kind of Muslims do we want them to develop into, and what are we going to do to get there? How, what's, what's the game plan? What's the road map? And what do we have to bring into our lives, and what do we have to get rid out of our lives to make this happen? And the other agreement that husbands and wives really should have is that they're not going to contradict one another or nag one another, lecture one another in front of the children. Because that isn't very conducive to raising children who believe that Islam works and that who come to it with a spirit of joy. And unfortunately, I've, I've seen this more often than not where even in my own generation of people that I grew up with, where there were families where the mothers were very pious and very practicing and the dads weren't. And especially in the young men, many of them grew up to not necessarily choose the practice of the bean, unfortunately. It was hit or miss. But I have seen majority of families where the fathers were pious and practicing and loving and engaged with the kids and the moms maybe were kind of loosey-goosey, lackadaisical. The, many of the kids have chosen to practice the deen and to practice it seriously. The dads have a power over their kids that really cannot be explained. And I think it might be the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the religion a patriarchal religion, that the deen comes down from the father. Because I don't think fathers realize um, how much value and how much importance they bring, um, bring to the practice of the deen in their kids. And for many years, I used to say this, and I used to say, oh, this is just data I've collected. This is just what I've seen in the community. I don't actually have science to back me up. But now we actually have science to back up this uh, assertion. There's a book called 
families and faith, how religion gets passed down across the generations. It's by Vern Bengston. He used to be a Christian minister. He started studying 2,000 families in 1972. 2,000 families, Jewish and Christian. And he followed them till 2006. So for 34 years, he would meet with them like every five years. And he wanted to see specifically what was it that caused the next generation to continue practicing the religion of the parents. And there were all sorts of factors that came into play that he looked at, but the overwhelming factor that decided whether the next generation was going to, going to continue being Christian and Jewish or not was if the father practiced Christianity and Judaism and was engaged with the children. What his studies showed was that it wasn't enough for the father to be pious. You, you can be someone who has the misbaha in your hands and goes to the mosque for all five prayers and has a long beard, but if you're not engaged with your kids, if you don't know them, if you're not taking time to get to know them, if you aren't having fun times with them, if you don't know their friends, if you don't know their stories, then it's hit or miss. But fathers who are engaged with their kids and practice the religion, so the majority of those, the religion, then continue to the next generation. Yes, Michelle. I just, um, I'm sorry, I just want to make a quick announcement. So we, we have about 15 minutes left. So we do have a couple of questions that we, I don't want to forget from the actual online survey. So I'll put those questions out there and then, Sidi if you want to um, tie in your comment after, um, you know, with the question, the response to the question, that'd be great. But um, the question that we received, one of them was how to talk to a young child of 11 years old about um, things like, you know, uh, kind of following fo following or falling into, um, what, what would you call it, uh, certain behaviors like um, dyeing the hair, right? Dyeing their hair after a certain cartoon character or a character that they, that they like. Uh, kind of, you know, wanting to emulate uh, people that they uh, like, a, a young child. So how to talk to young children about things like that, um, as well as music. So, you know, music is a big topic that a lot of uh, parents are, um, and children, it's causing a lot of rift in families because sometimes, you know, the, the genre of music isn't something the parents want children to listen to. So how do we navigate those types of discussions? So I guess it would be like popular culture ideas that children want to adopt or want to, you know, kind of uh, take, and if they in any way conflict with Islam, how would you uh, navigate those discussions? So if you can take that question, inshallah, and then please put, give us your comment as well. Wow, bismillah. Um, one thing I wanted to, to say again, it comes back to those reinforcement of core values. Um, if you're looking for any type of meaningful change, it has to be based on essential core values. And like I said, in my household, I love to come up with slogans to help us remember certain things. And so I have what's called the, the mantra of the house of Haru. And that is, our way is to build up. Miriam, can you finish it? There you go. Our way is to build up and not to tear down. That is literally the mantra of my household. If you see any of my other daughters, Feel free to test them on that. Ask them, hey, what's the mantra of the house of our room? They will say, our way is to build up and not to tear down. And it could sound simple, but just repeating that over and over and making that the foundation upon which we discipline is huge. So it means that we have made a commitment to never discipline our children. This is going to happen. Not always going to be, you know, what you can do. There's sometimes you just have to draw a line on certain things and, you know, prohibit certain things. But still doing it from the perspective of we're still trying to build you up. You know, even in my, the tone of voice that, that I use with my children, everything is still designed and, and instituted in a way to, to build them up, not to tear them down. And I've just seen too many of the tear down parenting. Like I've seen parents like go into their kids and at the end of it, it's just like that kid feels like he's just ready to fall off the, the edge of the earth. It. Like, why should I even exist if it's like this? You know, I felt like that before with my parents. You know, it's like, oh man, if I got a got this one bad grade in this one semester, it was like, oh over. Oh, man, you're not gonna be in this school now. And then, I was like, well, geez, why should I even exist? 
my whole purpose is to go to school to get a you know to get into college and I'm not doing a good job at that, then why should I exist? You know, in the humble love we have a merciful Lord who makes us realize our value is much bigger than that. So again, having core values that you can tie yourself um, back to. I've also seen this the scenario, something that the sister, uh, the sister both sisters brought up is the value of again that that head of household role and taking it serious, there's also a negative side effect. I've seen too many cases where there's a divorce, and now the father figure's not there, now all of a sudden the kids aren't practicing Islam anymore. So unfortunately, you also see situations where everybody was practicing Islam because of dad. So all this religiosity was actually just fake. You're just doing it to put on a good front, you know, a mask to your parents. So because I had seen so many situations like that, again, I, what I do to help remedy that is I, I, I speak very interactively to my children. I specifically told them very early, if I die anytime soon, I do not want you to throw your dean in the grave with me. Don't do that. You have to take this on yourself. So how have I tried to do that practically speaking? Engaging them in fudger. Sometimes it's going to be me. It should be me as the leader of the household waking everybody up for fudger. I say, look, sometimes it's not going to be me. So I need you all to step in. You all need to have five drill lines. And alhamdulillah, I really like, it's been a pleasure seeing the results of that in my household. Sometimes it's dad knocking on the door, right, Miriam? And sometimes it's Miriam knocking on the door. Sometimes pretty repetitively and really loud. But Miriam makes sure I get up, you know. <laughs> and I appreciate seeing her take ownership. Another story is sunnah prayers. Alhamdulillah, I've, you know, I feel like sometimes these stats, you know, our prayers and devotional acts, they have stats to them. 1999 or it was like this. And eight, you know, this year was like this. Same thing. There was a year where I just really felt like my sunnah prayers were just low. But Miriam and my daughters always notice they're always still trying to do those sunnah prayers regardless of whether dad is doing it or not, regardless of whether mom is doing it or not. And recently, alhamdulillah, after hearing a very good reminder about the, the value and the importance of praying the witcher prayer, like the two and then the one, after Isha, I was like, you know, I just got to get my winter back on. It's as simple as that. Like, I'm just going to get it back on, get that stat back up. And alhamdulillah, Miriam didn't have that problem. She's been praying with her. May God preserve her in this and increase her in it. And all of our kids, I mean, she's been doing it consistently on her own, even when her father has not been that witness for her to do it himself. And subhanAllah, I started doing with her. What happened? That day, you know what you did after. Right after I prayed with her, Next thing I get this big hug. You know, she just came up and just gave me this big hug. And she was like, Alhamdulillah. She was so happy. Yeah. Like, I was ready to get some stickers and cookies, you know, <laughs> myself. Like, I was just like, wow. And I even thanked her for thanking me. Like, thank you that you value this enough for yourself that you've been establishing it regardless of whether I'm doing it or not. And that even when you saw me do it, you gave me a hug. And it's like that hug just made me feel like, I got this. I'm going to continue doing that. When I feel lazy and thinking, okay, maybe not tonight, I think of Miriam's hug. And that's what I mean about making it a, a, a group effort as opposed to a top down. Now, about this issue of music, this is a big one, especially for me because I was a musician. I was in, a, in an alternative rock band, in an R&B group, in hip hop groups. I still write songs, but it's a big, big issue. It's one of the, the the things that has a huge, if not one of the hugest impacts on the human psyche and on the human heart that you can understand why it can compete with God. Right? That, that combination of sound and words, it can compete with God in the heart. It can go into certain crevices, deep crevices of the heart that myself, I'm like, I get it. Why there's warnings, why there's cautions about this. And it's not in my, in my place and in, in, in my expertise to get into the different 50 aspects of, of that issue. But I can tell you, even as a person who's sitting here today who still very much feels very impacted by music, who still loves different certain types of music, I can still tell you, with all honesty, I really appreciate the cautions that we have in our religion in regards to music. I think it's medicinal, and I think we need it. Having said that, we know that there are certain situations where I appreciate Al-Ghazali's approach to these things. There are certain situations where the, 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 
concise orchestration of melody and sound is medicinal. And we can consider that, okay, a person needs to, to be even treated with song. And there are certain, certain situations where a person already has a sound and balanced constitution. If you introduce that to them, it will actually cause sickness in that person. And they don't need that. So why are you giving it to them? You know? And then there's a the type of person who's just, they're fine without it. So you just leave it. Your type of person, if you give that to them, it could be actually hot on for them. Okay? So I would definitely say it's no doubt we live in a situation where this has a huge impact, impact on us. And again, take a group effort with it. If you know your kids are listening to music, engage them on it. Sit down. One of the things I did was ask one of my daughters, make me a playlist. Make me a playlist. Let's sit down. I want to know what you're listening to. Why do you like this song? Some say, oh, we're just listening to the beat. No, you hear the words, too. Even if you haven't memorized, they just can't recite them, they get in there. Okay? And that's the, the, the sound just opens up the portal for the implanting of the words, which is a lot of times the, the, the words is even more dangerous than the sound. But instead of just saying a stock full on, yanking the earphones out of her ear, what you listening to? You listen to that Catherine music, and blah, 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 blah. No, I didn't take that approach. What are you listening to? Is that your favorite song? Who is this artist? What are they about? What is their lifestyle about? Why do you like this song? What is the song saying? Get all the lyrics printed out. And I actually sat down and had full hour-long listening sessions with, you know, my daughter. And we just sat down. We listened. I had all the lyrics printed. And it was for, for her, it was actually the first time really seeing the lyrics like that. You know, and we just listened and we talked to why it was impactful. I even shared songs with her, songs that were very impactful for me in my life. And navigate it so then you don't feel this like you're not trying to create hypocrites in your house. Okay, you don't want like the Clark Kent syndrome. Okay, they look one way when they're around you, they get around the corner, they switch into a totally different costume. You know, you don't want to raise hypocrites. So just choose that engagement and don't just make them feel like ashamed of everything. Okay, there is things, you know, that shame has a place in our religion and there's a good place for it because it helps us to be people of modesty. It helps us to be people of God consciousness. But again, we are in a situation living in this culture, in this context, where we cannot pretend like we have a force field and that our kids have a force field. Engage them in these things with creative righteousness. Engage them and find the beauty. Oh, that is a beautiful line. That's great. Sometimes you hear a song and it literally makes you turn to God. Literally. You can hear something that's like, and it'll make you weep and change your life. How many times have you heard stories of people, I heard I was going to kill myself, and then I heard that song, and I did it. But also the opposite. You hear somebody was thinking about it, and they played this song, and it's like they went ahead and did it. Like Cypress Hill song, How I Can Just Kill a Man, that was a song. I knew a friend, he wanted to go and, and do something, like commit harm to somebody, and that's the song he would play to fuel, to give him the confidence to do this violence, he played the song. So it goes both ways. And again, I can't tell everyone what to do in your house, but just give you some advice. And that is, again, make our goal is not to destroy our children. And we literally, I think we have parents who are literally destroying our children. Okay, home is supposed to be a refuge. Home is refuge. Home is supposed to be a place of mercy, of help, of aid. Okay, so be there to navigate these things. Sometimes it's not just as simple, you can't do this and can't do that. Sometimes you may have to put that law down like that. But again, most of the things, especially something as sensitive and as heart-capturing as music, find out what they're listening to. Engage them on it. Ask them questions. Always, again, from the perspective of how can I build them up. Make them feel honorable so that they may act honorable. Music, movies, and video games. You've got to know what's in there. There's a lot of crazy stuff in there. And there's stuff that's good. So navigate with your children what's reasonable and what's good. There's stuff that you need to absolutely stay away from. Absolutely. And you've got to know what it is. Talk to your kids about it and they get navigated. So inshallah, best of luck. Uh, our du'as are with you. And, and work with them. One approach that I think helped us a lot when we were talking our kids about what they were watching, what they were listening to, uh, what they were doing is 
um, an example that was given in Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's purification of the heart class, he talked about how the heart is like a castle, and it's a castle, it, the heart is a castle or a fortress that you need to protect. And on the day of judgment, it's only the people with pure hearts who are going to get to enter Jannah. So what do we do to protect our hearts? And he explained that there's seven inroads to the heart, right? There's seven avenues through which shaitan comes and attacks the heart. So we talk to our kids about that. So the seven avenues that affect the heart are the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the hands, the feet, the stomach, and the genitalia. And so each one of those avenues requires us to protect that path to the heart and make sure that we're not letting those things get to the heart that's going to cause it to rust and cause it to get polluted. And so whether we're look, it's what we're looking at on Instagram or whether it's what we're listening to or watching on YouTube, we talk about, okay, well, how is this affecting the heart? Is it purifying the heart or is it actually causing it to rust? And if we are doing anything that's causing the heart to rust, then how do we remove that rust? Through dhikr, right? Dhikr, remembrance of Allah, and through tawbah, asking Allah to forgive us. And inshallah, so that our kids don't despair. They know that there's always a way back, no matter what mistakes are made. Thank you. I had, um, once had a mom come up to me after uh, a talk, and she said that her son had gone off to college and he was, you know, normal, typical teen. But when he came back, he started slowly um, expressing his interest in a particular genre of music, uh, which was goth music, something that she clearly, she just knew nothing about. But it really bothered her, began to bother her because he would wear, you know, like the dog, uh, what is it, the studded bracelets and, and sort of take on, you know, some of these um, physical sort of expressions, again, of the, the music that he was listening to. And she was really uh, caught up, and she's like, I don't know what to do. I feel like, you know, um, she was getting upset with him every time he would come to visit. And then what would happen is he would stop visiting. So I, when she came to me, she was like, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, you know, exactly like Sidi Harun said, I said, I think what you need to do is you need to show an interest in his music. You can't, if you continue to push him away and judge him and make him feel like he's doing this dirty, horrible thing by listening to this type of music, um, instead of trying to at least reach out and c come to a place of understanding of why that music appeals to him, then you are going to lose your son. And I was just very clear with her. I said, he's, you're, he's just not going to come on weekends anymore. You're not going to see him anymore. And he's going to go further, further into that world, which means less into your world. So, but the best way to keep the door of communication open is to at least express some interest and say, okay, I have no idea what this music is, why you like it. Tell me about it. Just like Sidi Hunter said, let me, you know, listen to the lyrics or, or read the lyrics. Let me listen to this and find a way to, um, to really kind of, again, bridge, bridge some understanding. It was, I remember, you know, she, when she was standing there, her daughter was with her. She was just kind of startled by my response. It never occurred to her to do something like that. She was maybe looking for a different answer, like how else can I convince him? And a lot of times with parents, and I'm sure uh, Hina might have the same experience because we both talk about parenting a lot, is that parents, when they come to us for advice, a lot of time it's about how can I, re how can I reprogram or control my child? Like help me, give me, a, give me a quick answer to reprogram and control. And for me that's really heartbreaking because my thing is exactly as Siddhi Harun said, let's not please raise hypocrites and let's um, go back to the roots of our deen, which is really about honor, respect, love, compassion. It shouldn't be about control. Parenting is not, the end all of parenting is not controlling your children. It's raising uh, responsible, God-fearing, God-loving individuals who will carry this tradition forth. But you can't do that if it's just, you know, looking at them like, you know, robots that you need to uh, have a remote control in hand all the time. How about engaging with them, talking with them, finding ways to inculcate uh, respect, mutual respect. This is how I think we just have to have a total paradigm shift about parenting. And I think a lot of our ideas of parenting are from back home cultures and the way that we were parented, which was very, again, authoritarian. Let's go back, because that's not Islamic model. Islamic model is not that. It's It really is about respect and love and and just understanding. And so uh, with that said, inshallah, we do have 
a couple more questions. And now you're coming through, huh? Now, at the end, of, towards the end of this. <laughs> but you want us to go on. Well, I'll take that as a compliment, inshallah. Um, did, we re did you read these? Did you, this one? So go forth with this one. Okay, bismillah. All right, alhamdulillah. So how do you approach a father who is rigid in his deen and doesn't really understand what the youth struggle with uh, what the youth struggle with today he wants kids to just listen because he says so uh, one daughter uh, wears hijab but sometimes wears it in a rap style uh, when she's wearing uh, but when she's home nearing home she will change the style back she feels like he will get upset with her how can kids find the courage to talk to dad that's an excellent question um, and I think fathers I'm gonna let you guys handle this especially father with daughter or well, both of you but I think the father with the daughter can help us here inshallah so I'll pass them okay so she's feeling like dad is just like too rigid, too rigid hard to talk to well sister I definitely want you to know just give it a try I want you to have the courage to at least say to yourself I actually tried talking to dad. Because as opposed to staying in a state where you feel like I just can't because he's this way, sometimes you just have to break through that and say, look, dad, I'm having a hard time talking to you, but we need to talk. I need to let you know that I literally sometimes change my hijab style right before I come into the house. Sometimes you just have to break that bubble. You have to pop that bubble. Just tell them exactly like the question was prevent, presented. Maybe, okay, you feel like it's too intense to, to go say that face-to-face. -face, then write it down just like it was written and put up here. Write your dad a letter and say, Dad, this is how I've been feeling. And, and again, it's always just like we're told when we want to ask Allah from something. There's like etiquettes to do. You should praise Allah, thank Allah, send prayers on the prophet. Then ask, right? Because now we're opening the way. Don't just start the, the letter saying, Dad, you know, don't just start being wrong. But just say, Dad, this is your daughter. This is me. I love you. I want to thank you for what you've done for the house and what you've done in my life, the support, you know, the protection you've given, the provision you've, you've helped. But I'm really hurting. It really, I'm struggling religiously. Because if he really cares, like, if you're really like Baba's girl, you can't help but feel a sense like, hey, maybe I need to, I need to rethink how I'm doing. Because him, a lot of times you don't realize a lot of parents are just repeating the way they've been taught by their parents. So we're just repeating the way we're taught. And that's why, again, in your household, you have to decide when you have your own household, take the best of what you got from your parents and leave what you know was not working. Don't just repeat it the same old way of doing things. So maybe he's, he, you feel too intimidated to approach him directly, then write it down. But you cannot just let that feeling simmer and fester. That's not healthy. Yeah. So dad, look, if you actually have an interest in helping your daughter make it in this life and the next, just take a deep breath and realize that you are not where, you know, ultimate control and charge and judgment rests. Okay? The fact is, your kids are going to make sense. Sometimes we have, that's one of the first things we have to come to terms with as parents trying to raise religious children. Your kids are going to do some sins. Okay? That's why we have such a beautiful hadith. Again, it goes back to having principles to fall back on. The prophet, peace be upon him, said, and it may be translated as, keep God in mind wherever you are, and fall away wrong with the right that offsets it, and treat people courteously. Halas. Treat people courteously. That hadith, I just love it so much, is from the, the translated and compiled in the book, The Content of Character, which is one of my primary books. I hope at the end of this we'll get into sharing some actual resources that have really been, we've each found really helpful. One of them for my household has been the prophetic character, the content of character, sorry, the content of character uh, translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, um, the full version and the copy book. So they have a, a full length book and then they have a summarized book 
that Sheikh Hamza's sister produced of just selections. And it even has the Hadith in Arabic and English, so you can copy it in English, copy it in Arabic, and memorize. Okay, but they're foundational hadiths that I just love because they're all hadith about character. And that particular one that, that I've just mentioned, I have it posted on the wall. It's in my house. It's also in my office. Keep God in mind wherever you are and follow a wrong with a right that offsets it. You're going to do wrong, but don't be stuck in shame and guilt. You do something bad, follow it up with something that offsets it. And then at the end of it, what does it say? And treat Courteously. God, it's so easy to leave that out. Just be nice. Just dad, be nice. Be nice. Okay? How do you how do you feel when, when whoever treated you the way you're treating them? Just how did you feel about that? Okay, and you'll be surprised you have a lot of parents holding in a lot of trauma themselves. And they're just passing on the trauma. Okay, so that's what I'm advising. Like, look, I have I I believe most parents actually generally do care about their kids at the Okay. okay, so for that sister, again, just try writing your thoughts out, but be blunt. Okay, start nicely, make your parent feel loved and honored, but look, there's something happening that's not working for me, and it's driving me crazy, and it's potentially driving me out of this religion. Do you think your, your dad wants you to leave Islam? If he's that particular, do you think he wants you to leave it? No. So be frank. You know, if you can't talk to him that way, that's tough, but I believe you can do it. Just try it. You know, my, my own daughter is here. One of them is here, and you know I try to make it an open, right, dialogue. If I've said something that didn't sit too right, I said, you got to let me know. And she does. I said, as long as you talk to me still with respect, with dignity, please feel free to speak up for yourself. Defend yourself. Let me know. I don't have it all worked out. Parenting is a work in progress. It's on-the-job training. Okay, we're still trying to figure it out, but I don't want to traumatize my kids. I don't want to be the means of my kids leaving Islam. And for a lot of people, it's their parents. I've just heard a story before I came here. A brother was telling me, you know, my, my wife, she's, you know, she uses the Quran as the hammer. He said, my daughter told me she hates Quran. Because when she thinks of when she, even she hears it now, she thinks about how every time she did something bad, her mom would just turn it up really, really loud in the house and blast it. And say, Allah's going to get you. What is that? He's unbroken. Oh, it's so disturbing. But I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it reminded me of a story um, of a girl that came up to me after one of the talks. And she, you know, sometimes people will come up and they'll use the, my friend is going through Line. I don't know if she was speaking about herself, Allahu Alam, or if this was truly her friend. But she said that her she was 13 years old, young girl, and she said, um, "I'm really scared. My friend has been cutting herself, and she um, has suicidal ideation. She's thinking of suicide. I don't know what to do. How can I help her?" And I said, "What's going on? Please explain." And she said, "Her ever since she was a young girl, from the age of three, she um, her mom has been very difficult on her." Uh, in, in terms of her religious practice, and she, um, one of the things that she would do is chase her around the house if she would to make mistakes reciting Quran. I want you to imagine a three-year-old toddler memorizing maybe Surah Al-Ikhlas or some, you know, one of the shorter surahs. And because she made a mistake, her mom would run around the house with a knife in her hand, scaring her. Uh, so this poor girl has trauma from from young age and all through up until she's thirteen. Now, ten years of this kind of life and she she was forced to wear hijab and then she would leave the house without it but she got to a point where in middle school she's done she wants to check out and her uh, coping mechanism was to self-harm and cut and now she's speaking of suicide this is a serious stuff for law um, I mean I, I you know I was of course uh, shocked and, and overwhelmed when she was telling me this and uh, I, I gave her some advice but I just, I've always thought back on that story as far as how we can, as C.D. Hunter said, we can really uh, destroy children when we don't ourselves have the right balance. So back to this questioner, you know, as far as, it's really about balance. If you approach your children's practice with that um, sort of iron fist and you want to 
you know, constantly shut down conversations, do as I say, do as I say, do as I say. You are destroying the line of communication between you and your children. And what is the positive end of that? Yeah, you might get someone who out of fear capitulates to what you want and, and what you demand in the moment. But as Sidi Harun said, if you've just created uh, someone who uh, be becomes accustomed to living a double life, uh, you know, or, 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 you know, just finding ways to wear different masks based on the cir circumstance or situation, you have essentially destroyed their spiritual journey. So we have to be very careful as parents with how the expectations that we have of our children to be realistic, to be practical, practical to be fair, um, and to pace ourselves and them. Islam came in 23 years. It didn't come overnight. Uh, and, and, they ha and, th and this was uh, during time when the Prophet was alive. He was there. He had, he you know, they witnessed miracles, and yet it took so long for the deen to be complete and for many people to actually really come to, uh, you know, to, to full, you know, full circle with their practice of deen. People were still, you know, having adultery and committing sin and fornicating and doing all sorts of things while the Prophet was with them. So what are we doing here in 2019 when we have our children bombarded with every message that says don't, you know, basically forget God, and then we are creating households like this. It's just, it's, it's insane. So we have to really step back, I think, and, and look at ourselves. And that's why, you know, when I was doing my parenting sessions here at, at uh, MCC, one of the first points that I tried to make actually during every session was that parenting uh, really starts with us as parents. You know, sometimes we think it's always just about how do I, you know, um, how do I guide my children? But it really comes back to us. Are we fit guides? Are we the right guides? Can we do this or not? You know, uh, the Prophet's hadith, you know, ala kulukun ra, or kulukum, ala kulukun wa kulukum an you know, every one of us is a shepherd and we're all responsible for our flock. What is a shepherd? Am I a qualified shepherd? Do I even know how to lead a flock? Do I know the role? And if you don't know the role, get to know the role first before you start, you know, falling into this, um, Type of becoming a parent, and, and that's you know that's a whole other conversation uh, for the young generation about you know wanting to get married and wanting to sort of start uh, you know getting having a family right away. Whole you know just slow down a little bit, prepare, prepare, prepare before you take on that role because this is an amano. You have souls that you're responsible for, so um, you know just balance is so important. Mashallah. So we have so many um, really good uh, you know questions here and comments. I wanna I think because in the interest of time. I uh, want to make sure that we um, just uh, hit some of these uh, or, or, or get to everything that we can. There was a comment here from one of the uh, kids, and I, I want to honor this uh, this question because, mashallah, yes, yeah, let's try to be as brief exactly. Yeah, exactly, speed. Thank you. So I'm going to try to go as fast as possible too. Um, this question or comment came from uh, someone in the audience who said that um, whenever my mom drives me to school, she's slow sometimes. I have no problem because my school bell schedule is good for me. The problem is that I wonder what people think. Mashallah, my mom wears a hijab, but if people see my mom driving slow and wearing a hijab, I think those people might hate Muslims. I heard many people like Muslims, but if they see a Muslim driving really slow in front of them, they might change their minds of liking Muslims. What should I do whenever my mom drives slow again? Thank you for the child who wrote this. It's such a sweet question. May Allah bless you. Um, your concern is valid, you know, uh, you're worried, obviously, about protecting your mom's image, but also the global Muslim <laughs> community. Thank you on behalf of a woman who wears hijab for being so concerned. Uh, very sweet of you. I think, you know, I'm not sure why your mom drives slow, if she has maybe fear or trepidation driving. Some moms, you know, they might have had an accident, God forbid, or something in their past that makes them a little bit more cautious. But maybe if you could um, talk about this with your mom and just let her know that you're worried about how people at school are observing her and maybe that it might affect, you know, because I mean, the reason why I say your concern is very valid is because there are people who are very unhinged, unfortunately, in our society. Uh, you know, a car, um, you know, road rage is real when people don't get what they want while they're driving because they need to get somewhere. They can be very, very uh, unhinged. And, and there are people, they've caused accidents, they've harmed people, they've literally shot people. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I think there's valid concerns of worrying if someone might react to a slow driver 
when, you know, if they're going really slow. And again, I don't know all the details, but if that is a concern of yours, I think you should have a conversation with your mom and tell her how you feel. If she's here in the audience and you think you know that this is your child speaking, then just maybe uh, talk to someone about your fear of driving. It might be something that you need to work on personally. You know, there's some fears there that you have to overcome. And then, you know, have uh, encourage dialogue further with your child about his beautiful question. Thank you. I'll, um, uh, oh, sorry, we, we still have more questions. So I'm going to actually uh, refer one to or uh, read from one of the questions that we got um, from our survey. There was a question about a, a teenager who really wanted to get a job, but um, his parents were or her parents were not on board. They were resisting. They were not letting them have a job. So uh, does any do any of the panelists want to take that on? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So so real quickly, I mean. Uh, what I infer, if you read it, is that it's a it's a girl who wants to get a job. I think um, you know in this society we oh, our culturally we have um, sort of overprotective inclinations towards our children, and that's kind of a theme that's coming out. Um, but the children have their own personalities, their own. Some are outgoing, some are ambitious. Um, some people want to have their own um, uh, you know sort of freedom with money in their pocket. So this is a valid issue that, that could be any one of those things that this uh, child is feeling. That, you know, I want to have some freedom. Maybe money is tight in the family, and I, and I want to have a little bit of freedom to buy the things that I want. Uh, hopefully it's not rap records, you know. But um, the, the child has a need to sort of grow outside the house. And some children are very comfortable in the home, and some ch children have this personality. They want to kind of explore the boundaries of, of what they're doing as they get older. So I want to keep the quite, the answer real short, but we're, we we need to watch from being overprotective. If it's something that isn't breaking the dean, uh, is within reason, you know, within commute, and doesn't put uh, your child in uh, danger, or they're not selling alcohol or doing any haram, it will probably um, help them like like learning a specific subject. They may want to go towards business or be doing something artsy. You should let that child a little bit, they're letting you know that they want to explore the world in a different way. And you should let that child within reason have their boundary expanded as long as they can be trusted and they can be safe. Um, it also teaches them very good values about earning money and knowing the value of a dollar and how much, it, how much you have to work in order to buy you know, an iPhone or a coffee and how you waste it. These are things that they need to learn. So inshallah, I think the advice I would give is to... Is to uh, Loosen the boundaries. Yeah, and have an agreement about, yeah, maintain a GPA. I think that's great. 10% uh, of your income might be going towards sadaqah. What are you going to do with your money? How, half of it's going to go into savings. Half of it you can spend on certain things. Um, those kinds of things, uh, you know, uh, I think, I think it, it requires a family meeting and a negotiation. But I think the child is asking for something very reasonable. And uh, the parents should be open to doing that making sure that they grow in the right way. I think I'm proud of the child for wanting to expand a little bit. Yeah, and the parents get better Eid gifts, right? We're going to take one more question, and then, inshallah, what I'd like to do is, um, how many of you actually looked at the survey questions that we put out for the teens? Yeah, just two? Okay. Um, we have results from those that I think we should, you know, like to disclose to you just to again leave you really thinking uh, you know with some food for thought about the gravity and the seriousness um, of many of the issues that our teens are facing because sometimes they they don't have the opportunity or they're not comfortable talking about certain things with the adults in their life but on an anonymous survey they might they they actually do alhamdulillah when they do participate they reveal things to us and we should all all of us in this room should really um, reflect on what's going on in their worlds, just to at least to, uh, to become more aware and to inshallah increase in our empathy. So I'm gonna get to those and then inshallah we'll end at that point. But before that, the last question, which I think um, it would have been, uh, I, I, I missed it until now, but I really think it's, it's a relevant one because a lot of our young girls do struggle with this and it's relevant to our discussion with social media and the influence that it has over so many of our teens. But one uh, issue or topic that I know I've heard a lot from our young girls are related to body image and, and uh, self-confidence and issues of beauty. So the question is, how do I um, convince my daughter that she isn't ugly? She's constantly comparing herself to celebrities 
and influencers, um, beauty influencers, that's what it references to. No matter what she does, she never thinks she's good enough. Um, and this is, you know, a very deep issue that a lot of our youth, our girls are dealing with. They're dealing with uh, body image, like I said, and, and just self-confidence issues because of the magnification of, um, of, of sort of, uh, of everything really about teen uh, life when it comes to social media. Everything's on display, right? And, and, people, and, and these kids feel like they have to put it on display. And if it's not good enough compared to so-and-so, then they don't get as many likes and that destroys their confidence and morale. So there's a lot of, um, you know, it's just so many layers to this. But I'm going to turn to um, Pamela Senna. Yeah, you want to? Okay, Michelle. I'm, I'm going to put this again on the dads. Uh, one of the things I have seen across the board with the most confident young women that I know uh, who have really strong, positive body image, they have strong self-esteem, they um, know who they are, they're unapologetic Muslims. One of the things I've seen across the board with all of these young women is that they have very, very strong, positive relationships with their fathers. And the fathers have been investing in their daughters from a very young age. And I know of a young girl who her dad has taken her out to brunch once a week since she was a little girl. And when they were little, when she was little, you know, some Maybe there was no big exciting conversations, but it was time just being spent together. Now the daughter is in college, and she openly will tell her dad if she has a crush on a guy, or if she's interested in somebody, or if she's got questions about marriage proposals that are coming her way. And the dad is, you know, being taken into confidence. And one of the things uh, this young woman once told me is that had a big impact on her is she once felt uncomfortable around a certain uncle in the community. And that uncle was a good friend of her father's. And she just mentioned it to her dad. The uncle hadn't done anything. It was just kind of a sixth sense that she felt around him. And she told her dad that, you know, he, I just feel uncomfortable around uncle so-and-so or whatever. And she expected her dad to defend him, to tell her not to think like that, to not, you know, make any kind of assumptions. But instead, she said her father said to her, Always trust your instincts when it comes to men. And that really had a huge impact on her. And so there have been valuable conversations happening with the father over the years. But getting back to the original point, these young women who I admire who don't seem to be following the greater trend of like wanting to change the way they look and wanting to use a hundred different filters before they post a picture and worrying about what guys think about them, Across the board, these young women have very strong relationships with their fathers. And if there isn't a father in the picture, um, they have an uncle or an older brother or um, a grandfather, somebody who takes time out to be with them. And the, and the mother has made sure that there is a strong father figure in the daughter's life. And Dr. Leonard Sachs talks about this in the book, Girls on the Edge. He said that Girls in high school who don't engage in premarital sexual relations, who don't engage in risky behaviors, who don't engage in drug experimentation, smoking cigarettes, he said across the board what those girls had in common was they had a father who showed up to all of their events. A father who showed up to their spelling bees and their sporting events and their you know, cheerleading tryouts, whatever. So same thing, if, if there isn't a father, then an uncle or a grandfather or uh, an older brother, somebody who's a mentor to the young woman, letting her know that she's valued. Oh yeah, I, I have a friend who uh, grew up in a small town where there weren't many Muslims. And she and her siblings um, grew up to be amazing Muslims, mashallah. And her father is a very pious man who every town he ever lived in, he would build a masjid there and very respected in the community. And I asked her once, how was it that you you and your siblings grew up to be such amazing Muslims, considering that you grew up in this little town where there were no Muslims around you, pretty much? How, didn't you, how did you not get sucked in by the siren call of the culture around you? And she said, I love this quote of hers. She said, when you feel love in the home, you don't look for it anywhere else. When you feel love in the home, you don't look for it else. And she felt that love from uh, a strong male figure in her life. Can we 
Yeah, it's exactly 5.30, um, and I will not keep you much longer. I, I want to thank you all again uh, for being here. I'm just going to quickly go over the results of the, um, the survey. So the questions, if you didn't see them, I, I actually didn't count exactly, but I'll just go through them. A lot of them are pretty heavy subjects. If you have young children, you don't want to, them to hear these subjects, and I invite you to please have them leave the room. Uh, but for the parents, oh, sorry. Yeah, for the parents who are okay with it, then I, um, you know, they can remain, inshallah. But I just want to give you that sort of um, disclaimer in the beginning. So the questions that we asked teens, this was specifically for teens to, to give us their answers anonymously. How often are you exposed to or do you hear about depression in an average week at school? We had, um, mashallah, 37.5% say that at least once a week. Or one, uh, yeah, once a week they they uh, they, they get exposed to that. Twenty five percent also responded four times a week. Um, Twelve and a half. So there's mashallah. I'm sorry. Wait, I, I might be actually. Yeah, I apologize. Just thirty seven and a half percent said once a week. So let's focus on just the the bigger numbers. Have you ever been offered drugs at school? Fifty percent uh, responded yes. So fifty percent yes, fifty. How many times have you been offered drugs at school? Um, at least one time, 75% of the respondents said at least once. Uh, mashallah. So three times was 12.5%, and five times was 12.5%. So this is, you know, mashallah. Have you, ever been have you ever been invited to view pornography at school? 25% of the participants said yes. And 75%. How frequently have you been invited to view pornography in an average week? 100% of the respondents said at least once. So once per week. The ones who did, they, that's how often. Have you ever been invited to engage in any type of sexual behavior at school? At school. 12.5% said yes. Have you ever been invited by the same gender to engage in sexual activity? Alhamdulillah. But all of the respondents said no. Um, how often are you exposed to or do you hear about suicide in an average week at school? 62.5% said at least once. 12.5% said twice. 12.5% said three times. And then 12.5% said five times. This is during a school week. No, this was a, a matter of how often you hear about suicide. So, six, yeah. Yeah, it's about, yeah, in an average week. Yeah, nobody said no. Do you know someone or, or do you know someone or more than one person who regularly cuts or engages in self-harm? 37.5% said yes. How many times have you heard about someone at school who wants to change their identity? One, uh, one time, uh, or yeah, at least one time is 25%. 12.5% uh, is at least two times. 25% at least three times. 12.5% at least four times. 12.5% at least five times. 25% um, at least six times. And then 12.5% at least seven times. They hear this. Nobody said no. This is a matter of changing their identity. This is how often they hear this. So these were, we, we kept it to these issues because these are the issues that we, in our line of work and what we do in terms of our engagement with the community, we hear these issues a lot. And we wanted the teens to actually give us their feedback about what they experience so that we can, again, bring this to, our, to everybody's attention, to all of our attention become more aware that these are the things that our teens are struggling with. And that's why these types of discussions are so, so important. Um, and inshallah, if we're able to do more panels like this and MCC puts out surveys, I really hope that our families out there will take that seriously and actually ask their children to participate in those surveys and to give us more feedback. Because the best way for us to, to heal is to be able to at least recognize where the harm is, where the 
where the pain is, where the suffering is. If we just turn a blind eye and pretend like everything's going to be fine and miracles are just going to happen, we're going to actually uh, really be in for uh, some very unpleasant, God forbid, uh, issues coming up in our community and our family. May Allah protect all of you and all of our children. Um, I want to again thank all of our amazing panelists for their ama wonderful insights throughout this um, this panel. I'm sure we all have learned. Jazakumullah khair to all of you. Any parting uh, words or remarks from anybody before we make sure? I just wanted to um, end the session by just reminding everybody that um, parenting feels overwhelming. And sometimes we find ourselves feeling really disappointed by what our aspirations were, what our hopes and goals were, and then seeing the results maybe not being what we had hoped for. And I think it's really, really important for us all to remember that the wheel is still turning. It, the story's not over, right? The person who's on top today could be on the bottom tomorrow, and the person on the bottom today could be on the top tomorrow. And what we all want for our children and for ourselves is husn al a beautiful ending. And we want um, them to die with the shahada on their lips and in their hearts and with their iman intact. And that all begins first and foremost with dua. Everyone should just be praying for protection and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah and tawfiq in our time with our children. And nobody should be despairing because um, in the end, no one loves our children more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We don't love our kids more than he does. And they are in his protection. And we just pray that we can fulfill the roles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And let's all pray for each other. We're all in it together. Uh, just in conclusion, um, I did want to always like to leave some good takeaways, some, some, something tangible. And I did pretty much everything I've been talking about. Um, I didn't give a lot of citations, uh, specific uh, verses, uh, of Quran and specific uh, hadith. But everything I've said, I've, it's, it's inspired from those sources, uh, textual sources and also living sources uh, that I've had the good fortune of, of witnessing in my life. But I did want to mention a couple of specific uh, textual resources that, has been, that have been very, very helpful uh, in my life personally and in my family's life. And that is the book, Our Master Muhammad. So just write down the book, Our Master Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which you can get from Rumi Bookstore, you can get from the Zaytuna College Bookstore, just that title, Our Master Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A lot of the cure for what we're going through is literally falling in love with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it takes work. But that's one of the books that I've found that really just brung the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life and character, and specifically, it just really brung it to life in a very special way. And that's a book that we read as a family. Also the book Being Muslim, which I was happy to see that there's a, a group of converts who have a book club and they're going through the book Being Muslim by Dr. Asad Tarsim. May God bless him. Uh, that book, I think every Muslim should have that, not just converts. It's a great book. I went through that book. We went through that as a family from beginning to end and it's awesome. The other book is The Purification of the Heart book by our dear Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. May God bless him and his family. Because you got to know what you're made of. What is this thing we call the soul? What is its properties? What lowers it? What elevates it? Knowing those basic principles is at the root. You know, that's that's where you start. Um, the other one is the Muslim supplications uh, throughout the day and night. Those things, literally how you start your day and particular at par that you should say in different situations, that is essential. It literally it's been an indispensable aid for myself as a convert. One of the first books that I was given is Supplications for the Night and Day, what you say in these different situations. And it really, really has been helpful to, like you said, we don't, we don't know when we're going to die or how. We don't, we don't have control over that. But we can at least be people of Ethkar so that when we do go, we can feel comfortable that ourselves and our children, inshallah, with people of Dikr, uh, when they went out. Also, take some Tejweed with Kari Omar or 
Sayyid Uzma Husseini. We have many people in our community who we love who are qualified in teaching the science of Tejweed. That's something I regret not sticking with uh, as a convert. It's something I started but not stick with. Inshallah, it's not too late, right? <laughs> but get that in your system to be fluent in reciting his word, and then after that, work on the meeting. The meaning. Uh, finally, I just wanted to remind everybody that Islam is not an annihilator of culture. Um, we're, we live in this thing called the West and Western culture, and you hear about Islamic culture and Western culture. It always feels like there's this tension. And sometimes there are areas where there are clear tent lines of tension that are understandable. But Islam does have bring its own aspects of culture in terms of its own unique practices and, and ideologies and so forth. But there's also good things in the culture that we find ourselves in, and Islam is not meant to just do away with all of that. It's an enhancer of culture. So one of the big remedies I've found for youth and even parents is just get a hobby. Find a hobby. Find something else. Some people think the only expression of Islam is the, the rituals, the prayer, reading Quran. There's other things you can do, and by doing them with a certain intention, they become devotional acts. Or the, they, they elevate those things. So find hobbies that you all can enjoy and do as a family. Collecting things, fishing, hunting, whatever it is. My family, for instance, we all enjoy Star Wars. So my family, we cosplay. We all literally have custom homemade Jedi outfits. We have custom lightsabers even. Custom lightsabers that have Islamic calligraphy inscribed in them. That have the Bismillah in the sound font of the lightsaber. Like we really, we take it serious. So, but that's something we enjoy. We already have Jedi-like outfits naturally with these jazz, like the outfit this brother has on, long robes. All he just needs is a lightsaber on the side. That's it. But that's something we enjoy, and we mix with a whole other community of Star Wars fans and cosplayers as Muslims. And they love that. Many people have been exposed to aspects of our practice through that, that medium. Okay, so get a hobby. Go get some Legos. That's another thing we do. We love buying Lego sets. We build Lego sets together as a family. My wife, my daughters, we build things together because that ties into my little mantra, right? Our way is to build up, not tear down. And I feel that by building Legos, we're interacting with that metaphor. So please don't feel any sense of despair. That's only a quality of the devil. The devil gave up. All, all Shaitan had to do was say sorry when he made his mistake. So we don't want to take that quality. Like it's a beautiful thing to be Muslim. It's a beautiful thing that Allah gave us life, period. So let's make the best of it and try to make it easy on one another. Let's treat each other how we want Allah to treat us. You know, if we want Allah to be gentle and merciful, then be merciful and gentle with each other. Our children are our trust. And we just need to beg the Lord daily to, to give us success with this trust and to make it easy. And to everybody who's called in and uh, I mean, written in and given us questions, just may Allah heal everybody and give everybody what we need and make it easy for us and, and give us afi and tawfiq. Yeah. Yeah, I do have a dua. As a matter of fact, I will tell you, I will, this is my favorite dua, and I hope somebody comes up and takes a picture of this. This is what I call the superhero power-up dua. Because we also live in a culture where superheroes is very popular. We know what a big you know, Avengers movie is coming up, Avengers Endgame. But for us, we have a different idea of what the end game actually really looks like. But when I read this dua, it's an authentic dua, I felt like this dua is like, it's like a hidden treasure that Allah sent down for whoever really wants to, to get it. Okay, because you don't hear it really cited a lot, especially like this. It's, it's, it's called the supplication for light. It's an authentic supplication, and it, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has recited it in a few different with a few different variants, and um, one of the scholars has compiled all those versions of the supplication of light into one uh, text. So I will close with the supplication for light. That's very important for myself, and I hope that it becomes a part of your lives as well. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. O Allah. Place in our hearts light, and on our tongues light, and in our ears light, and in our sight light, and above us light, 
and below us light, and to our right light, and to our left light, and before us light, and behind us light. Place in our souls light, magnify for us light, and amplify for us light. Make for us light, and make us light. O Allah, grant us light, and place in our nerves light, and in our body light, and in our blood light, and in our hair light, and in our skin light. O God, make for us a light in our grave and a light in our bones. Increase us in light, increase us in light, increase us in light, grant us light upon light. Amen. Let there be light. May the force be with you. Allah and the Muhammadan light. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum. And there's a book here if anybody wants to take a picture of it called Positive Parenting in the Muslim Home. Uh, it's a book I recommend for establishing routines and communication methods in the home. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you again for coming out. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.